First of all, I want to thank you all for attending the seminar. You be the judge. I think everyone is a judge in their own right. Every time you pick a stud dog, every time you pick a litter of puppies, you're the judge. You roll them out, you decide whether they're out of here or they're staying, you're still the judge. We have a great panel of people here who have been a judge for many, many years. Not, not licensed, they are now, but they started off, okay? First of all, I want to thank um, the College of San Antonio for sponsoring the event, and for Frank and April Trevino, where are they? <laughs> for sponsoring this great thing. This came out of their pocket, okay? I think it's great that they can bring educational things to Texas, okay? So just spread the love. We have a great panel of people here. I'm sure you've seen them before. One is Judy Evans, one of our icons in the green, clarion. Okay. I had someone write, we have a little, little write-up on each one of them to get you kind of familiar from their humble beginnings before they became really famous, okay? Judy started in California in 1965, but found that the Tocallan Brennan type is what she wanted to breed. So she moved to the East with two beautiful bitches that went back to those breedings and she went from there. Judy Evans. Our next panelist is Matt Stelter of Winder. Matt was born with the um, love of horses, actually. He loved the world class of Arabians. His mother introduced him to, to, to human books, novels, when he was nine years old. He realized it was much more feasible as a child to breed collies than horses. <laughs> so he bought his first collie at the age of 12 years old, okay? And in the pursuit of breeding world class collies, and now doing it for 30 years. Matt Stelter. Annette Rawlings of Sealor. We have a long history, Annette and I, we're very close together. But she started breeding collies with her mother in the night, part of the late, late 70s with her mother Judy Stringer, which made the kennels Sealor. She started off in junior handling in the 80s and 90s, showing grooming dogs. She was, and then 25 years later, she has accomplished two best of breeds at our national specialty. And that rocks. Connie Dubois of Selvin Collies. Welcome, Connie. I feel a cute story about Connie. <laughs> um, Connie is a toddler, went for a little walk, ended up getting lost in an orange grove, couldn't find her. Okay, is that true, Connie? <laughs> That's what I'm told. <laughs> um, she, her mother got really upset, asked the neighbors to help my daughter, find my daughter somewhere, and their old pet collie named Timmy found her before her parents did. <laughs> they used to say, when they found Connie, they saw Timmy there growling at them, don't touch my owner. <laughs> Devotion. Connie's first bred homebred collie was finished in 1989, and then she joined forces with Dr. Cindy. You all know Dr. Cindy here. Yeah. And that group venture produced a best of breed at 2005 National, which is fantastic. And then go on to doing 17 best in shows. Wow. And 100 group ones. Connie Dubois. Nick Joins, handler extraordinaire of Sunway. <laughs> Nick started in college at the age of 15 years old back in Nashville, Tennessee. He hasn't changed, has he? <laughs> he mentored with Wade um, and John, John Woodring? Wade and John? Uh, at, at the age of 17. 
In years to come, he has handled many national best of breed winners, winner's dog, and best of winners. Six shoes, that you said? Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, he's pretty famous, you must know. <laughs> Nat joins. <laughs> Kathy Drabik, you didn't got to give me your bio. I'm gonna make it to go along. <laughs> Kathy, in the mic, please. I don't know your bio, you are telling the audience it today. Oh. Okay. Kathy, when did you start in Collies? Ni about 1985. Okay. And I actually started with my daughter, and she was in the 4-H program. And she started with junior showmanship in the 4-H program. So with that, then we joined the local uh, kennel club, and from there we started in Collies. And I read my first I think it was 1989, and she finished in 1990, and the rest is history. There you have it, Kathy Drapik of Westwood. <laughs> and we have one more breed icon. We, uh, we, we kind of anchor the table with breed icons. Larry Bullerford of Wincrest. <laughs> Larry started in college, starting, actually watching the young boy, what, watching the Lassie shows and reading the Tehran books. Got his first collie in 1968 and joined the North Texas Collie Club. Um, he had his first litter in 1969 while still in junior high school. His early mentors were George Horn and Marsha Cullo. What great mentors, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he had a great friend, Grace Cosson. His first champion was in 1979, co-bred with Grace. And now he celebrates 50 years in collies. Larry Give me a second here. The wind's blowing my notes around. Let me take that. Oh, me? I was a homeless child. <laughs> um, put a basket at someone's doorstep. No. Um, my mother bred collies years ago, dabbled with the Brandwin line and Ginger, okay? I hated dog shows. I used to go to the Aconius tournaments and spit spitballs over the balcony into the ring while they were judging. I hated it so much. Okay, that was me. Dogs hated me, I hated dogs. I don't know what it was. My mother got a schnauzer in for boarding, and I loved him, and somehow he loved me. So. My sister Laurie had, had basically um, did a lot of junior handling in Aconia, and she's won. So my mother gave her more attention. Well, I didn't like that. So I went to junior handling and won a large all breed junior handling. So I showed her up. And then from that point on, I got interested, met Panda Rosano, and you know, we, we know how it went there. So Dan Cardoza, country view. <laughs> I had a lot of uh, thought about how and how and what kind of questions to actually put on the panel. So I asked each one of them to give me a couple. I wanted really well-versed questions, okay? I think we should ask the first one. Are we all ready? Got your thinking caps all on? Okay, all right. I thought first before a whelping box even materializes in your house, a breeding has to take place, okay? So I thought the first question would be, when choosing a stud dog for one of your bitches, what is the most important criteria to you in, in choice of mate and explain your reasoning? Judy? Oh, let me get the microphone, sorry. Is it on? Well, I think probably the most important thing in choosing a stud dog is to know his pedigree. Because you need to know what they come from, because if they come from nothing, they're never going to produce anything. The second, the second thing is you're not going to find it on Facebook, because those are probably not the ones that you're going to want to look at. I just remember 
in the olden days, when some of us living relics started out, we sat at ringside with our catalogs and we looked at the dogs in the ring to find the ones, the sires that could produce the puppies that were the most beautiful. And that was what we looked at for a stud dog. You know, a stud dog needs to have breed type. He needs to have a pedigree that's that's line bred or inbred in order to probably be able to bruise, to produce himself, unless he's a fluke. And we've had those flukes in the breed, but we find them because in spite of their, their shortcomings in their pedigree, they end up producing the puppies that make us all want to go out and get them. I always used to say when I went to the National, I wanted to have the puppy that everybody wanted to come home with. And, uh, you know, it's, these are things that to me are really important. I'm sure other people on the panel probably have uh, something to say about that. For me, it really comes down to what's, what is a stud dog that I believe I can get excellence from my bitch. So, yes, you want the pedigree. Um, in some cases, it may be inbred. Sometimes you're looking for that outcross. You want the breed type, uh, the class, the excellence. But it really comes down to the bitch and which stud dog is going to be the complementing piece uh, to get the most excellence out of the bitch. Sometimes it is just looking for that sperm donor for your beautiful bitch. Other times, you're looking for some missing pieces uh, to add to your program. Um, but when looking for a stud dog, it really comes down to which one is going to enable excellence from your bench. Um, a lot of what Matt said, I agree with. Um, finding a stud dog to breed to the bitch that you have, you have to know your bitch's pedigree and what it produces, what you want to keep, what you want to improve on. Um, if a virtue that you're going after um, that the stud dog does not have, don't do that breeding. Don't breed to a stud dog from a photograph ever, ever. Um, and, you know, be honest with yourself what you need to get from a stud dog. Your bitch is going to be most of what you get. say definitely you always want to look at pedigree. Um, I'm very particular. Is it maybe closer? There we go. Um, I'm always very particular on the stud dogs. I have to look and look and look at them. Um, I look at the pedigree. If I can, I'll look to see what they're producing. Sometimes they're not proven. Um, and you take that risk. That's a gamble you take. But I've always been told when I earliest, from my earliest days is you're breeding grandparents. So and what I've seen when I've bred, because I've got enough generations now, is when I see those individuals and the, the puppies from the resultants, I, I do see strong grandparent influence. Um, yes, you've got to have the same, I, if, whether it's an outcross or in-cross or outbreeding, however, both animals have to be, whether it's your bitch or your dog, have to be the same phenotype. They have to look similar. You don't want an, an odd extreme bred to another extreme. They have to be similar, um, especially if you're doing that outcross because you're used to choosing your puppies, having them look a certain way. So when those puppies come about, if you've bred to an outcross dog that's not similar in phenotype, then you're, you're going to get a chance of having something that you're not used to seeing. And the whole idea is you want to reproduce your look, what your vision of that standard is. Uh, I've got a little bit of a different perspective from uh, the handling perspective. We show animals from all different families and um, uh, different parts of the country. And I think one thing that matters first and absolutely foremost is they've got to be sound of mind and body. Uh, if it's an animal that is beautiful type, stands over the ground, beautiful length and arch of neck, uh, beautiful length of head, turn of muzzle, but they won't eat or they can't get along or they're freaky, or legs go in seven different directions, I'm just not interested. I think there's got to be a basic template from which to, to go from. And obviously pedigree, uh, details, uh, what 
particular what particularly your bitch needs is of importance, but I don't think it if you go for those things but you get an animal that, that can't do what you want it to do, you've wasted your time. You you wait you've absolutely wasted your time. I agree with um, a lot of every, what everybody said too, and the pedigree is important. When I'm choosing a stud dog, I always look at the mother. The mothers have to be pretty mothers, pretty grandmothers of the stud dog. And, um, and it's choosing like the phenotype, uh, and then of course, you know, that would complement my bitch. And um, Well, it's kind of not fair. I'm the last one on this panel. They got all the good answers. And I agree with all of them. Uh, I think it's very, very important that you have breed type. Most often, often most importantly, is breed type. In a, in a stud dog, I want a dog with a nice round muzzle, beautiful expression, an outline and balance. To me, and they have to have good legs. They have to be good doers. Uh, and they have to complement your bitch. I mean, what you breed to a stud dog for is to improve what your bitch needs. And I think that's, I mean, you never double up on faults. You try to double up on virtues and go out and get what you need from a stud dog, whether it be line bred, in bred, or out crossed. So. Well, since you're last, you're first in the next one. Don't, don't, hold on. Okay. okay, well, since the puppies are now born, you chose your stud dog. Okay. Next question is, over the years, I've heard people claim they can pick their puppies at birth, okay, or by three days. Is this really possible? Well, I don't think so, personally, but, you know, I have heard people say that also, and uh, I, I just don't understand how that can be. There's so many other factors into uh, picking a puppy, of course, expression structure, movement, all those things that you see later on, uh, you know, like 10, 12 weeks. Uh, but I do hear people say, oh, well, this puppy's got an outstanding stop at birth. That's going to be the one. Or, you know, I can tell structure on the puppy at birth, uh, you know, this and that. But I don't think it's possible, but maybe there's a secret. And I don't know. I'd be curious to know if anybody else thinks that. Well, I guess <clears throat> uh, what's, what's picking some of the puppies in a litter, I mean, when they're first born, uh, some of the excitement to see how they, when, when they start nursing, see if they're up on their legs, how their rear structure is, that arch of neck, how it is when they're nursing, you can kind of pick puppies that way. Some, uh, Usually the flatness of their heads, the roundness of little muzzles and bone with puppies. Uh, have I picked any at birth? Um, no, not really, because they change so much within two or three days. Um, and then, you know, throughout the weeks. So it's usually around 11 weeks that I usually pick puppies. Actually, within the first couple of weeks, or first couple of days, we're just want to make sure they don't get squashed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about it. Um, I want to see them when they're up and, and moving out, out in the yard and see kind of how they react to things and noises, if they freak out, if they go toward it, um, if they want to be with you. Uh, uh, Marcy Fine told me one time, she said, the puppies, when I go into the yard, if they don't want to be anywhere near me, I'm not interested. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. If they're not interested in being with you and want to do something with you, they might be beautiful. Maybe they want to, Maybe they need to go to somebody else. A, a, different, a different home that wants a project and is willing to do a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not willing to do a lot of one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but I'd like to see them on their, on their legs and how they respond to things. And um, there's, there's no way we could pick any puppy that are, there's just no way. Okay, I'm gonna say, yeah, you can pick one from birth. The moment they're born, how do I know that? Because God did that to me for Dawson. All right, he was the only puppy in the litter. Wasn't me. <laughs> so that's the only incident I've no actually known where you actually you only have one puppy in the litter and it turns out great. Well, you chose that puppy at birth. But other than that, when they're first born, you know what? You're just looking at them. Are they going to survive? You're looking at them, how they're nursing.
nursing? Are they arching their little necks? Um, how, the, how the tails look? How they're digging in with those rear feet? Are they going to have good angles? You do a lot of watching um, with puppies. But I never pick one firstborn other than what God's given me. Um, in, in reality, no, you don't pick a puppy from birth. Um, you sit there and you watch the litter, and you there's one that will pop out, and you just watch it. You watch it, you're hopeful. You're very hopeful. Um, and then you do eye checks, and hopefully that puppy's still left. <laughs> um, but realistically, from birth, no. You're very hopeful. You, in your mind, you will pick one. But it doesn't mean that that's the one that you should keep in the end. We pick our puppies right around 10 weeks of age. Um, that said, we look at them very closely at three days of age. And I would say two thirds of the time, we know our pick puppy at three days, but then we watch them carefully as they progress and be ready to switch a pick, you know, depending on where they end up. I can't think of three puppies that we picked at three days of age that we just knew. Um, two of them went on to be number one dogs and the other one was a romp. So, there are times you just know, um, but more often than not, no, you're waiting till 10 weeks of age, um, maybe a couple of weeks more or less, depending on your line and the stages you're looking at. Well, I have an opinion about this. I, I'm just happy when my puppies are born that they're alive, and I watch them as they're growing, as they're little. I want to see them with their necks arched when they nurse and a big fat tail you know, you know they're getting nutrition. I look at my puppies when they're three weeks old because I think that's a really important age to look at the profile of the head, to feel the bones of the head. You can tell what the head's gonna look like at that age and the eyes are open enough that you can see the expression. You can find the, you can look at the, the dark haw. You can look at the haws on the eye and you can tell whether they're dark or light you know, by a dark paw is going to, they look all the same, but a dark paw is going to have a little thread on the end that, uh, you know, is going to tell you it's going to be dark. To me, that's kind of important. More important is the fact that it's going to be small. But I, after that, I don't really look at my puppies. I mean, I watch them every day. Five weeks is a horrible age for our puppies. They go through a round-eyed stage. At eight weeks, we have the eye checks. You know, we see what is going to be, you know, able to be shown so that we don't get excited about a real, you know, a prospect that's not going to be able to make it. And that's the age when I can pick the ones that I don't like. And I know that they're ready to go to their homes as pets. But between eight and 10 weeks for a collie puppy, actually, at 10 weeks is a really perfect age, I think, between 10 and 12, to get a flash from the ones that I'm really looking at, where you can see what the profile is going to be. You can see their expression, and they sh the ones that you want to look at, you see something in them at that age that shows you they're going to be worth growing up. And then you just basically have to forget about them for a few months. You pick the ones that you're going to grow up and hope that they make it through the four month stage. But that's when, when I pick my puppies for the ones that I'm gonna keep. I've just never been a prophet. I couldn't pick at birth. I tried. <laughs> Great. It is interesting to watch a litter mature from birth to choosing a show prospect from the bunch. What certain things do you expect to see in your litters at certain ages to help you decide which puppy grow out, Judy? I think I kind of answered that question uh, with the thing with the puppies. Three weeks is a really important age, you know, for me. After that, I just, I want to watch the way that they move. When my puppies are five or six weeks old, I take a lot of pictures of them, which I don't put on Facebook, but I look at them to see how they stand and what they do, because sometimes you know, when you're sitting there watching them and you know, 
know, you can see things in pictures that you don't necessarily focus on, you know, when you're looking at the group of them. I really feel like, you know, before eight weeks, you can't, uh, you know, you really can't pick a show prospect. Eight weeks is the age for me to, you know, to decide what the pets are in the litter, and then, you know, between 10 and 12 weeks is when you, when I pick the ones that I think are worth growing up. Can you repeat the question? Okay. It is interesting to watch a litter mature from birth to choosing a show prospect from the bunch. What certain things do you expect to see from your litter at certain ages to help you decide which puppy to grow up? Again, I think I probably spoke to those things in my, in my last answer. Yeah. Um, we do, like Judy said, we do pictures. Um, I think a a real good rule is we know pictures on Facebook live. Your pictures don't. And a lot of times getting that perspective of looking at it in your face without you know human emotions that are wrapped up in these puppies and what you think you're seeing, um, that's a very valuable tool. Um, but again, as far as which ones are, you know, it, it's tight, it, you know, it's temperament, it, it, it's all the things that you want to see and you're hoping it's all coming together in the right puppy. Thank you. Yeah, I, like I said, I watch, hopefully. I have one usually in my mind. Um, I like to pick my puppies at eight weeks old. I found with my family at eight weeks is what I have at three years old. Um, five weeks old, don't even look at the face. Your eyes are gonna be round. <laughs> Just don't. But eight weeks, I can usually pick my puppy. Um, around four months, they're gonna go off you're going to be high with the eyes, the body's going to be stretching out, the legs are going up. Um, we don't do, don't usually show our dogs until they're a little bit older, they're not puppy flyers. Um, what I did the breeding for it will be the first thing that I look for, if there's a virtue that I wanted to get from my stud dog, for my bitch. Um, that's what I'm going to work for. I'm not going to keep the puppy that looks like the puppies that I've bred for years because I went for something else. So that's the puppy I'm going to pick. Um, it still has to look like it came from my kennel, but that virtue has to be there that I bred for or that's not the puppy I'm going to keep. Well, I think, once again, ice start looking at them when they're on the mom after they're born you watch you're watching the litter as a whole who's got this great arch of neck um, when they're nursing who springs that tail and you can you can see even when you're watching them on a hole in the box their interactions you can see how their temperaments are and to me key, temperament show temperament is one of the key things that i choose for it's because I know that I'm going to go on and do something else further with the dog. And if the dog doesn't like a show, it's going to go to, it could be the most perfect dog, it's going to go to a pet home where there can be a couch champion. But I really look for a lot of personality. I look for the strong puppies. Um, when I say strong, I'm not talking necessarily the big robust puppy. That might not be the ones. A lot of times your small puppy ends up being your big puppy in order. But I'm looking for one that's strong mentally in that litter um, and as they as you're watching them between when they're born up until eight to ten weeks um, eye checks always rule something out They'll, or they don't rule something out um, but i always look for that temperament and they've got to have a good strong drive to show because i want the dog to enjoy it i i enjoy it and the dog must enjoy it or it's not worth my time my effort or anything like that so what i tend to do with puppies when their eyes are first open is I'll take like baby meat, put it on my finger and just put it around and you'll see the ones and it's usually the little, the, the ones that have a really good appetite are the ones that they'll, or if you have a hot dog even, they'll snap at it with their teeth because they're used to playing, but they'll grab for it. Those I'll watch a little bit closer because I know that they're the ones that have that food drive and that focus. And as they get older, each stage of the game, around by eight weeks, you should be able to say cookie, and they, your show dog will show itself. 
but it's got to have all the other pieces together. But the show, the show dog part has to be the very last piece. At, at this point, we're pulling together different things, so I really can't even address the idea of uh, consistency or what you know, looking at specific things at specific ages. I can say it's really more a matter of elimination with us. It's, you know, eye checks are one thing. I will say the first thing when they open their eyes and when they start looking at you, I'm immediately drawn to the prettiest face and the cleanest skull, the, the prettiest one. I'm immediately drawn to those. So I kind of get, narrow it down to the two that grab me first. They're the ones I kind of look at. Now, eye checks may get you on those, maybe they don't. Uh, and then once we go through the elimination process, it's kind of what you're, what you're left with. Um, but I, I really can't address any kind of idea of consistency at this point with, with what we're working with. Well, I think everybody's pretty much addressed, you know, about picking puppies. I usually start picking mine around four weeks, um, try to see where their stops are, um, the movement, uh, arch of neck, Balance, overall balance of puppies, um, cleanness of head, and um, and of course you know the temperaments. That's really important too, and that's basically what I look like for when I'm. Um, I think it's really important that you remember to pick on the virtue that you went to do the breeding for. I mean, if you're going to do an outcross or if you're going to do a line breeding, whichever, but whatever you're trying to improve in that particular breeding, you really need to select for that particular quality. Even though it may not be the best puppy, the next generation can prove very useful uh, if you breed it the right way and you actually got what you wanted from that, that outcross or that why you did the breeding. Um, and I think the, the pitcher idea is, is really enlightening because Pam and I, you know, we, we, Pam's a great photographer, by the way. She does all of my pictures and she does a great job. But it's really uh, when we start doing puppy pictures and we look at those pictures, you know, it's, sometimes it's not always what we see in person, but sometimes we can pick a puppy from the picture. It's like, oh, that puppy is really you know, photogenic or like you're caught up in the moment. You're yeah. caught in the moment. Yeah. You don't see what you see in the photograph. Right. So anyway, I think that's a, you know, that's a good guide also when you're picking puppies because sometimes, you know, the puppy that you don't always see right then and there actually turns out to be the better one. Uh, so just a few tips. We have one more puppy question. I'm going to move on to other other things. As a breeder, what are the, mo the four most important qualities that you select in your puppies in the order of importance? Four. Um, first, eye and expression. We're looking for proper placement, color, size, uh, you know, ear placement. Of course, here we tape ears, but you know what I mean. But I think expression is number one. Balance uh, is number two. Correct front structure, correct rear structure. You know, top line, even on puppies. I mean, you can you can see all that. Um, temperament is absolutely a have to. You cannot have a show puppy or a breeding puppy if they don't have correct temperament. They've got to be sound, good doers. I mean, sound in temperament and and structure. They have to be good doers. And uh, coat. I mean, coat is really hard to keep. You got to breed for coat in every generation. And I really think that's important. They have good coat factor. So, that's it. Yeah. Um, I guess if we're picking with puppies, that'd be the what I would look for first is like the roundness of muzzle, uh, strong underjaw, because I want a nice tight lip, um, arch of neck, and balance, good shoulders. And I know it's hard to pick like tail sets at such a young age. Because they all kind of have the tails up a bit, but um, you can see where the tails come off their backs at least. To see if they got a little slant for puppies. I would say probably um, a pretty face, um, smoothness and lightness to the skull, 
uh, a pretty making shape, a pretty balance that uh, glides across the yard, stands pretty. Um, uh, what is that, too? <laughs> um, a great temperament uh, and an easy doer. You know, it's got to be able to eat, got to be able to cope with life, and um, just be a general, overall appealing buddy. Well, going into as far as the litter, I would hope at that point in time that what I've bred, for the most part, is fairly sound throughout and consistent. So I already, already have a consistency that I'm expecting already in the litter. So I'm not going to, and to me, consistency is, is body and structure. So I'm going to assume that they're going to be have that body and structure. Um, but the first thing that I will look is, is going to be for expression. Um, the eyes are the window to the soul, and especially in our breed. Um, if, if the dog grabs you and holds you, or the puppy grabs you and holds you, and holds your eye, and I like my puppies to look me in the eye. I start as soon as their eyes are opening. I'll hold them up in my face and we'll make eye contact constantly. And that's a very big, big, big thing when you're conditioning your puppies early on. You really want them to get them in their face and when you're making noises, for them to look up at you and make complete eye contact. But it's those eyes because when you do that, you'll see that expression. And that one special puppy will really it'll really come out to you. Then, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm going to be looking for an outline. I'm going to look for that ex beautiful extreme neck, beautiful length of body. I like the length of body, and I like to see them cover the ground pretty. Um, I do look, I want to say number two for me, really and truly, is probably looking at head detail, because that's something that, like, I probably that struggled. I'm sitting there probably, we're at our best heads we've bred in the past maybe 10 years where we're at it now. Before that, we have, we've had issues with the heads full and stop. You know, you ish, you're issue. So you tend to look at that very, very strongly. Um, legs and bodies have never really been a, an issue. But once you find that puppy with that face, that expression, and as long as the head, and I'm, I'm make, making it as a given that the body is there, um, that's the puppy I'm going to gravitate to. Great. Yeah. Um, first off, Beautiful face, expression, eye, it all goes together. After that, it needs to be a balanced dog with a good shoulder. Um, and it, it has to have carriage. The way a dog holds itself makes all the difference in the ring. Um, one, two, three. That was four. That was, that was four. The time, movement will be there as well. That's move there. On. You only have four. Uh, first would be picture and balance. Uh, we all want the proud picture, um, but not at the expense of balance and soundness. Um, number two, certainly expression. Um, it, it has to be a collie when you look at it in the face. A great collie can't have an average expression. Um, number three, certainly head detail. Um, and four would be class. Uh, we want a family that is dominant for class, I and mean, that's not showmanship. That is a dog that is capable of showing off the great virtues it has. Um, and when someone walks by the ring or by our backyard that isn't a collie person, we want them to be able to look in and recognize, I'm looking at greatness. This is special. Here I am, the last one, huh? I was thinking about this while it was going down the pike, and I was thinking if Marcia Keller was here, she would say, the four things, expression, 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 expression. Because without it, you don't really have a copy. But the other thing that I want to see is something that takes my breath away, something that's out of the, out of the ordinary. You want that balance, that, what you want, that overall picture, that lightness of head, the things that make our dogs special. You want a sound mover, we all want that stuff. But you know, without the expression, it's not a collie. So for me, if it doesn't have the face, they could forget it. I'm gonna answer this question because this is, these are important things to me. I want a puppy who can man the ground he walks on. It's part of the proud picture, okay? I want him to walk like a lion. 
If they don't, their fronts are bad. I want a beautiful, curvaceous body. And another thing, if the head is correct, the eyes are correct. And there you are. And the eyes are correct. Hopefully the expression will be there also within the eye. Okay. We're done with puppies now. They're growing up, getting real ugly. <laughs> Don't come to my house right now. Um, so I think right now, we're at a turning point in the breed where a lot of these seasoned breeders are seeing various changes and they're not liking it. It's making them nervous, it's making me nervous. We're always trying to find these great stud dogs and here we are racking our brains to find them. I'm sure you've all had the same thoughts in your head, okay? So we're gonna go into some more questions about this. Who was or is the last great collie stud dog? Who motivated you? And what was the sire proposing for? Judy? Holy mackerel. I mean, seriously, the last great stud dog. That sets a tough one. Um, whatever. I think maybe we probably need to think about our own families of dogs because it's hard to talk about, you know, other families of dogs and stuff, so I can think about dogs that were important to me, and one of them was Champion Clarion's Night Rider, who was actually the foundation sire for us. It was, she was, he was by Champion Impromptu Ricochet, and out of Champion Clarion's Silver Satin, and he's in all my pedigrees. You know, you can go 15 generations and still find them you know, line bred and inbred on those dogs. Um, you know, and I've had other dogs from my family that I thought, or from families that descended from ours, like Champion Lorian After Hours Blues and Champion Clarion Incognito, that were that were all excellent sires for me that could sire the face and the picture and give the overall type that I liked. You know, it's hard for me to talk about dogs in all families because we all have our particular points of view. Um, I mean, I'm going to let everybody else talk about their family. Just to clarify, it was the most recent one that we saw? It said the last. Who was or the last great college dog that motivated you? And what was the sire for Pope? Well, um, for going with the last, um, would have been a country view give my regards. Um, he, he, Danny's dog. Um, I remember when he walked in my ring, I think he was about a year of age or 18 months, and I mean, it was like, he came through and it was like this picture of, it was class, it was outline, it was expression. You, I could see these eyes coming before they ever made it in the ring, and I just fell in love with the dog. Fast forward a couple of years and you start seeing his puppies hit the ground and you can pick them out. Um, not everyone was perfect, um, but he was dominant for the, that expression. There was a balance and curve to the bodies. Um, and rightly so, a number of them went on to win the national specialty uh, time and again. So um, I think we have seen a dominant stud dog in the last 10 years. I have to agree. <laughs> um, Definitely, Connor has impacted the breed for the better. Um, the puppies he's produced have that beautiful expression. Um, they have carriage, balance, um, and I have to say, you completed your goal with that dog. Thank you. probably has my, my mental picture and it was as a stud dog was and I, I'm gonna come, I'll come forward but was Storm Along, Shamont Storm Along. To me that dog he, he did everything. Um, when I was at the 88, 88 National which is in Massachusetts? 88? Yes. 88 yes. Um, he was there as a veteran and Peg let me go over him and I have to tell you I still I'm getting goosebumps right now when I went over that dog's head. 
um, one of the most beautiful dark eyes, beautiful eyes, and it's so hard, as all of you know of your rears, it is hard to get that face on a tricolor. So hard to get that like dreamy face. It's easier to get it on your blues, your sables. Tricolors, hard, very hard, and that dog had it. Um, moving forward most recently, I actually, from what I've been looking around, there's a lot of dogs out there that have been making, you can see second and third generations coming from them that have been quite influential for me personally. Um, we bred Sachs to um, Anthony, which was Barksdale Locklear and Liaison. Um, and I really like what I've gotten from him and what I've gotten now three generations down from him. And we're fixing to go out four generations down from him. I, it's a very similar look to what I saw in Storm Along. Um, that's, that's probably where, yeah, that must be the most recent one that I would put, pick for my family. I would say a dog that stands out for me was, you now this is many years ago, was uh, Critic's Choice. Um, to me, when I, when I saw the dog as an old dog, um, I, I measure every expression by that dog, even to this day. Um, the, the beautiful eyes and um, just the way they were set in the skull is, is um, that, that to me is like the benchmark. And um, so uh, that, that would have to be the one for me, pretty choice. Well, I, I think, you know, as of today, it would be uh, Danny's dog, Connor, give my regards. He's impacted the show ring with his offspring, and <clears throat> he's been uh, bred to many different families of, uh, you know, many different types of bitches, and uh, the offspring, what he's produced here in the show ring, and, and what's one of the nationals, is incredible. Well, I'll go back to Connie's uh, dog, uh, Storm Along. Well, it's not her dog, but she mentioned it. When I saw him at that same national in 88, oh my God, I mean, that head was like glass. I mean, you could go over that dog's head and it was just smooth, it was one piece. Beautiful expression, the muzzle, he's very masculine. Uh, he was just a very impressive dog. Uh, bone, coat, soundness, I mean, he just had it all. Uh, more recently, I would say Bowen Island. I think Bowen really did a outstanding job of producing beautiful expressions, muzzles, outlines, you know, nice curves. Uh, I think he did a lot for the breed during the time that he was siring. Um, and another dog, uh, totally different family, and going back just a little farther, uh, Freeze Frame. I mean, I, I think he was just a beautiful dog. I put him up several times, you know. I, I finished him as a class dog, uh, so I was proud of that. And I, I really thought he was beautiful, beautiful detail ahead, uh, beautiful balance and outline, moved well. He was kind of a total package dog. So those are my choices. Great, thank you, Larry. Since we're right on just our dogs now, um, one more question. We've had an issue probably trying to find dogs to breed to. So this question to you, Larry, is how do you improve the breed with the absence of high quality dominant stud dogs? Whoa. You better have some strong quality bitches. And I think we do. I mean, you know, to, I think the bitch is very underrated sometimes. I mean, it really takes an outstanding bitch to carry a family. And a stud dog better have a great mother. I mean, that, if he's going to produce, he better have a really pretty mom. I think that's important. Um, but it's, rough, it's, it's tough to go out and find dogs to breed to that compliment your bitch, this masculine, and that's another problem, you know, we don't see a lot of masculine dogs today, I mean, uh, a term, <laughs> should I use it, I don't know, a term that Danny has used quite often is a lot of the dogs look like drag queens, I mean, they're a little, they're too, too, they're too bitchy, they're not masculine enough, and, you know, I guess if you have a big doggy bitch, you know, you could breed to those those kind of dogs, but I think a male should really be masculine. Big muzzle, big bone, big coat, outline, and uh, that's it. The question 
is, how do you improve the breed with the absence of high quality dominant stud dogs? Gosh, just what Larry said. I mean, you know, it, the dog has to have a great mother. And, um, and, it, and it's, you're, you've got to have a high quality bitch. You know, you, we love the bitches that we breed. So it's really hard. I'm looking for a stunt dog now. I have absolutely no idea. I'm just going <laughs> to hand it to Connie. <laughs> Thanks for your honesty. Jeez. <laughs> okay. I wasn't quite expecting that so soon. <laughs> um, basically, you know what? It's it's the bitch. It's the bitch. It's the bitch. It's, it's the bitch. Um, looking for a stud dog. You know, you gotta know what you have and what your bitches are producing. You gotta know what's behind them. Then you go for your stud dog. And you really need to do a lot, a lot, a lot of um, investigation as far as what is that stud dog producing? What is he consistently producing? And that's the positive and the negatives. And then you gotta decide, can I live with the negatives? Because I will tell you, when you outcross, you're gonna bring in those negatives. You bring grandparents, like I said before, you do bring grandparents. And you might not see it on that first generation, the next generation, something's going to pop up. Um, you know, whether it's filled in stop, high tail set, and you're like, well, I didn't remember that dog having a high tail set. Um, but the, definitely, it's mainly on the bitch, in my in per personal opinion. And the stud dog, you do want a stud dog to look like a male. I want it to be masculine. Um, I don't want it overdone. I don't want it heavy either. There's a difference. But you want the boy, when you look out there in the ring, you don't want to say, is that a dog or is that a bitch? I'm not sure. But dog's going to produce that. He's going to produce bitch, bitchiness. If you're looking for a bitch, that's fine. But if you want a male, you better breed to a dog that's got that real masculine, I'll call it like a stallion look. Um, that Those things that just define them as a male. And that's very hard to find that stallion look in males now. You know what you don't like in the breed that's going on. Hopefully, you don't have it at your kennel and you want to stay away from it. So do not ever breed to that virtue that you don't like that's coming through in these other dogs. Um, and if you see it come up in your puppies, it's not, a, not something that you want to live with and don't keep that puppy. It doesn't, if it's, if it has a croup that slopes down and just, it's not a balanced dog, but it has this face to die for, I'm sorry, there's not gonna be balance, it's not gonna move right, don't keep that puppy. This is hard. Um, so often you're looking for that stud dog that just isn't going to mess your bitch up. Um, for many years, you know, the quality is in our bitches, in our breed. You know, as you watch a national, you know, you might have two or three males that jump out at you and a dozen bitches. Um, it's just a fact of the breed. Um, so a lot of times it is. It's the quality is going to be in the bitch, and you're trying to find that right male. Um, however, if you can find that dog, um, he may not. He's not going to bring everything you're looking for. But if he is line bred to something that was dominant for what you're looking for, you're increasing your odds. Certainly, we all love a stud dog to have a beautiful mother. Um, certainly, that increases the odds. But I've also seen a lot of decent stud dogs with beautiful mothers that can't produce. So that is not, a, you know, the golden rule of picking a stud dog. But it should put things um, in your favor. But um, flip side, leaning on a well on a pedigree with a mediocre dog usually doesn't work either. So I am a pedigree geek. I want to be able to look at it on paper and have it make sense. Um, but there's no absolutes. This is hard. Um, if there is, you gotta take a couple swings at it. You're not going to you know you're not gonna bat 100 percent on this. Um, but if you're learning and when you do that breeding, that boy, it made sense, it looked right on paper, um, and you did not get what you were looking for, first the puppies get sold. 
but then you try to learn something from it that hopefully you can apply uh, the next time around. Could you read that question again? I can find the question. How do you improve the breed with the absence of high quality dominant stud dogs? Prayer might help. <laughs> this, this could be a good thing. But I think we need to look for the dogs in our breed that are, someone used the word, stallions. I mean, that's the kind of, in any other kind of livestock breeding, you want to have a male that looks like a male, that looks dominant, that has the virtues that we want for our breed. You know, it's hard to find them. That's, that's the problem. We've had a lot of really beautiful bitches at our nationals lately that have done really well. Maybe we need to look for some of the sons of those beautiful bitches. We need to look at the pedigrees that are behind these dogs. And, you know, then we need to say our prayers because I think that there probably is no pat answer ever. It takes perspective. You have to look at these dogs like Anthony, like Laren Liaison, like Storm Along, like the dogs that, you know, that have been pillars of our of certain lines in our breed and everything. We don't always know who they are until we know what they have produced. We have to look back on them with a little bit of perspective and see what comes down from the dogs that were the great producers and what their mothers look like. That's probably the best way that we can look at to find, you know, a candidate to be a stud dog for our bitch. We always have to take in to consideration what the bitch needs, you know, what virtues we're looking for and what the dog can sire, but you don't know this right off the bat. Sometimes it just takes a lot of luck. Okay. Hold the mic, please. You've done this breeding. Now you're not happy. Oh, what have I done? The question is, what is the easiest virtue to lose and now the hardest bridge to get back. Judy. This is me, huh? Okay. Yeah. Nothing is more important to the collie than the expression. You know, it sounds a little boring, but it's really the truth. If you lose that, you know, nothing else really matters a whole lot. You know, it depends on what you went for in the breeding. If, you know, if it's a mediocre litter, and you look, the best puppy in a mediocre litter may just be mediocre. Dump it. You know, don't waste your time. Look for, you know, for the virtues that you, that are important to you. And uh, that's all I can say. It does seem so many of the virtues are recessives and expression, length of head, uh, and so forth. It can be alarming how quickly you can lose them. You can have a kennel full of dogs that are, you know, beautiful, and you think, oh, they're going to be dominant for this, and then you look uh, a generation or two later, and it's gone. So, um, the virtues that are recessive, and there's a, there's quite a list of them. Um, they can vanish in an instant. Um, expression is probably the worst one to lose. Um, I would say the hardest one to get back is a good front and shoulder. Everyone's pretty much going through me. I don't want to sound like verbatim here. Um, expression is easy to lose. Um, if you're, to me though, if you're breeding it generation to generation and you, you're getting, you have on a whole consistent heads, you're getting that pretty eye. It's more finding the one that's got the prettiest eye in the litter for you to choose. I know that when you inbreed, which Cindy and I have done a tremendous amount of inbreeding, and then we, have, we find ourselves, we breed out, and then we'll come back in, and we'll, we'll breed back in. But what I've found is, which I never thought would happen, is um, you can lose your shoulder assembly, and that length of the, the upper arm you can lose that so quickly. And you can see it around in the ring even today. Um, the dogs pick up their fronts. 
and they should not be happening. You should not hear, this is not what you should hear in the rain. You shouldn't hear that. Their feet should be, they should go stretch out. That, that bone should be the same length as the scapula. And if it's short, it, they're going to pick up their front. And you can go to any ring and, and watch, and you'll see it, and you'll see it in other breedings. But the collie should reach forward, barely get, barely get that foot off the ground. That front foot should barely get off the ground and put it right back. And we're not seeing that. And a lot of that has to do with that short upper arm. Um, well, like I said, we're, we've, we're still kind of looking for footing here, uh, trying to pull different things together, so I can't really answer that. I can say in, in Shelfie land, it's definitely turn a muzzle and eye. Um, if you don't watch out, it's gone. And then you're two generations trying to pick it back up. And, and uh, nothing is more heartbreaking than to look in a litter, look in a welcoming box and see these ugly little faces looking at you, knowing that, that you could have had, if you paid attention, you could have done something different. But uh, uh, as far as Polly's, uh, I'm not that qualified yet. So. Um, one thing, I guess, if, if you're if you've got soundness in your kennel, don't ever breed away from soundness, because if you breed away from soundness, it's hard to get back. And another thing is the eye set. Is I think that it's if you have too much width between your eyes. Uh, it's it's a hard to get rid of the width between the eyes, and also the uh, underjaw lip lines. You know, uh, it's hard to keep a good lip line, to keep those lip lines tight. Well, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I think expression is probably the easiest thing to lose if you don't select for it in every generation. Um, you've got to really be on top of it. I mean, it's just really hard to lose and keep. Um, fronts, I mean, I agree with Connie and others that have said uh, fronts are really important. We see very good, uh, very few really good fronts anymore. Uh, the well laid back uh, shoulder and the length of the upper arm. Um, tails are really something you want to, you do not want to keep a bad tail because it just continues generation after generation, generally speaking. So, but I think expression is probably the, the hardest. If you lost everything in your kennel, in all your family of dogs, what current kennels would you go to formulate your look all over again and explain why? That was my question, by the way. <laughs> Holy moly. That's, <laughs> that's a good question. And I guess what I would have to do is if I lost everything I have, I would have to go to the people who have dogs that come down from Your my breeding. Your family is gone. It's the whole family gone. is the gone? The family is gone. All of them. I can't, even, I can't even go back to ancestors. I always or, think back in maybe the eighth generation. Eight generations. I'm like, I'm not that old. Well, I guess I am. No, I mean, based on your dogs. Hmm. That would be tough. I would probably have to look at dogs from families that I put up and, uh, you know, when I judged and things that have appealed to me. This is really a crummy question to ask. <laughs> but what do I like? I mean, I, I want to go to a kennel that has dogs with beautiful faces usually, with overall picture, with coat and style. I want them to look like the dogs that I, either that I had or that I wish I had and um, you know my dream dogs and try and find them I think that do I do I have to name people yes. all right yeah you know what would I do I might go visit Debbie Fall you don't know I might go visit Matt and Anita these are dogs that you know that that fulfill my picture and stuff I you know I would probably I like the dogs that come down from liaison I think they're beautiful I think people on the Annette had some really pretty dogs and you know I would want to find something that had the, the the picture and the face that I wish that I always had and I would just start all over again because 
that's what it takes and try and find you know my blend i'm saying this because a lot of people here don't know what direction they're going and that's why i want them to hear it from everyone's lips here so i don't know that there'd be an individual kennel i would go to what i would begin looking for is progeny today of kennels kennels i would go because every line is formulated from a lot of different kennels. I would go get progeny descendant from Champion Country View, give my regards, and I would begin the selection process and create from there because I feel that would get me immediately closest to my mental vision. Debbie's. Um, I call them the Northwest Seymour. Um, they just, it's a very similar type. They have the pretty outlines and curves. Um, oof. I know the rest. Even, but even hers, I mean, if she go back, that's family, so I don't know if it doesn't count. It, that's, yeah. Um, another, I would probably go back to um, Tartan side to get that soft, sweet expression. Um, they had the old Tartan, the old Tartan side dogs had beautiful expressions, so I would go there. Okay. based on very old, old, old dogs, anyway. Um, and it goes back, basically, to Tartan side, which I would like to say Glen Hill. Um, it goes back to something that would go back to Glen Hill, which would be either Tartan side or um, the Mary Robichon. I like, I like what, they're, what they're producing, um, and I also like what, what you're producing. It's a, it's a particular style that I'm looking for. It's a dog with a light, clean head, muzzle, beautiful eyes, um, pretty outline, nice legs. And that's sort of, you know, and everything goes back to the whole family stuff. So those would be who I would be going through. We're in that position right now, actually. And um, there's pieces of different different places that uh, dogs have shown. And um, uh, so I can't say any particular place, but uh, I'm, and I'm not going to mention any names. Raven. You're on the spot. Oh my gosh. I've admired so many families of dogs. I love the Eden Rock dogs. I love King of the Road. I love Gail Kay's dog. He's got beautiful expression, long head. I think he's sorry for King of the Road. I love Debbie Fox dogs. I love Larry's bitches. I love John and Buddy's bitches. It would have to be bits and pieces of everything. It'd be a lot of scouting around. That's a tough question. We kind of answered but, already. Larry. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. You know, this really, I mean, as a judge, I really, and, and I know there are other judges on the panel here, but I don't really feel comfortable listing current families that, that I could actually be judging somewhere down the line. I mean, that's a little uncomfortable on my part. But, um, you know, um, you know, I would just have to go with families that I felt had the qualities that I was looking for and the qualities that I had built in my other, my, my family, previous family, and try to 
duplicate that, but I really don't want to mention names. Yeah. Well, I'm going to say something. Yes. Danny, where would you go? <laughs> yeah. I'm not ashamed to say it. Country View was based from Blue Jeans, which I still cry. That bitch was spectacular. Um, air apparent type of dog, blue jeans, and a little bit of um, Brandon. I was trying to find individuals and certain families to try to reproduce that type. I mean, I get this whole thing, but I would get the elegance, the stature of blue jeans, which I think can come a lot from what Frank is doing and what Matt is doing. That beautiful, beautiful they call it a swan neck, but it's just, just a carriage of neck, a proudness, and that beautiful crest of neck, almost brand new look and type of stature. I would try to find that, and then I would slip her around trying to find something with a good face, and then maybe something with a little bit better head, but just dabble in it without ruining all the curves. And I think that was what I would try to do with him. Okay? Now, we're here to attack judges. <laughs> Not really attack them. <laughs> to, I guess the proof is in the pudding of their ability to pick the appropriate dog. Not meaning we tell them to do it, but do they know correct type? You know, like, like what Annette said one, she said they have bred dogs for 30 years, and they had, no knowledge of movement. They won on this or that, and now they have their license. And now we're in the position where the breed is so desperately needing movement again. You know, um, so that's my thought. <laughs> but anyway, back to the judges. So anyway, this, this is the question that leads up to what I just said. How does the ability or inability of specialty collie judges to identify and reward the best dogs influence the direction of the breed? Okay. How much does the ability or the inability of a specialty college judge to identify and reward the best dogs that influence the direction of the breed? Annette, you take it. Annette? Okay, I'm not bearer of the line. I think I've kind of almost covered it before. Um, <laughs> judges don't decide my breeding program, for one. Um, I show to judges that I respect their opinion. I can take criticism and I'm open to it. Um, I will work with it, um, but again, Judges shouldn't be defining your breeding program. I, I was looking at Larry, I'm sorry. How did judges affect your breeding program? Yes, yes. So, I would echo that. It's, it's a true breeder is not letting a true breeder is not letting what happens in the ring impact their breeding program, but there's no doubt what happens in the ring affects the majority of the breeding programs in the breed. And I'm saying breeding program rather than their line or, you know, all of us have breeding programs. There's only so many that have a line, but um, there's no doubt that you know, that list of judges that you're confident in are going to find the best dogs in each en entry, it's getting smaller and smaller. And if you're only showing a couple dogs, it's not such a big deal because you can be really choosy and you can take weekends off or you can pull out on Saturday night. But if you have more dogs, at some point you need to win points too. So it, it's tough, um, it's frustrating, but it's also, it's reality. Uh, before we start, uh, Cindy wants to say something. I'm sorry, Judy. Hello. So my comment to that, and I'm going to uh, ask you guys how you feel about that. So maybe the inability of that judge does not affect you as a breeder, we breeders that know better, but how do you think it affects that novice that is sitting out there watching those dogs that are getting put up? Because I think that's a really big problem right now. 
bad as Facebook. Same thing. Shall I say something? Next we talk. We need a hero. We need, a he we need the heroes that we used to have, the ones that we looked up to, the Billy Ashenbrenners and the Glenn Twyfords and the Edith Levines and the Betty Crawfords and the George Horns. There's such a list of those judges that you knew you could take your dog to and if in your heart you knew that it was a good one, that they would find it, and if they didn't find yours, they'd find something that you loved, that you could respect, that you could understand. And these are the kind of judges that we need. We need to have people that know the breed and that are honest enough to look at the dog for what it is. Forget about families and faces and the politics, which is such a big deal for some people and put up the dogs that you know that they like, that if they're breeder judges that would be the type that they would want to breed or that they would respect for their virtues and have the guts to put that up no matter who's showing it. Those are the things that we have so little of now and that we need more of. We need more, we need heroes. I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I've watched so many of the ones that I really loved and, you know, that are no longer with us, and I'm looking forward to the new ones among you that are going to show us what you've learned eventually. You know, we've got some people here that are going to be, that are newer judges and that are interested in becoming judges, you know, hopefully in there we're going to find some more hope for the breed. We just need, we need people that know what the collie looks like and that are honest enough to give us their opinion. Uh, before Lori speaks, anyone want to still comment on what Sydney had to say? I actually, I, thought, I think I did, is saying there's no doubt what happens in the ring impacts the breeding decisions on the whole. It's powerful, and, but it's, it's a reality. I don't have the answer how to fix that. Cindy, you're not loud enough. I'm sorry. I've never been told that. So, I think a lot of the problem is too, I'm going to say it and I'm probably going to get a lot of crap for it, but we have judges out there that have no business judging our breed. And I'm talking specialty judges. When you have people judging our Is he clean? Is he, you know, how did he move? You know, 
Do you offer an opinion? You weren't, you, you weren't asked for a critique, but here's somebody who's wanting to breed to that dog, and they want to know what your opinion of, of, of that animal is because they didn't know who he was. They did, you know, they're not there to put their hands on him. So what did you see? What did you feel? What was impressionistic about that dog? Do you take those phone calls? Do you help those breeders out? to help progress the breed or judge what's available at that show at that time. Um, as local clubs, I mean, the Nationals once a year, um, so we can kind of knock that out, but your local club, if you don't hire those judges to judge your specialty, if you honestly don't think they're going to do a good job, if a ch or ch don't enter to those judges. If you don't respect what they're gonna say, you know, don't show to them. What's the point? Well, I think all, all clubs are dying for an entry now. They want a new judge. Our club, and that guy on the same club, trying to get people who just came on. Aren't you? We love you the new judges. Yeah. Try them out. If they don't prove what you like, you don't show them. That's it. If you get a good entry, the club don't get them anymore. There's your lesson. Okay, you know, honestly, this one's a little difficult for me because I'll, I'll be honest with you, living in Florida, we don't have that many specialties. And we lost Miami, so we even were down on that. So our specialties are few and far between, and we have to travel for them. Um, and honestly, if I, I look and see what the, ju the judge has put up in the past, and I look back on those records because, especially our yearbooks, are extremely valuable with that. Because we can go back and look at the judge and see what dogs they put up over a period of year, whatever, how many times they judge that year. And I would like, okay, well, I, I see them put up this family, so I'm thinking maybe they like this. But if I see them all over the place, I won't generally, it, it's got to be a lot for me to take my time to drive eight to ten hours to a, to a show. So I do a lot of background research, and if I don't think they're going to like what I have, I'll support spe I'll support specialties where I can. But if I don't think the judge is going to totally like not like what I have, I'll just save my money and my time and my resource. I would say just uh, um, vote your uh, disapproval by not entering. Save your entry. Do something else. Work on your yard that weekend. Stay at home. I mean. You know, if it's something you feel really strongly about, support the ones that you really think do a great job. Take a number of dogs to them. Take puppies for socialization to them. But uh, if you don't think they're going to do a good, good job, do something else. Have, enjoy the weekend doing something else. Um, on the um, national judges, uh, I think it's been brought up before, but I'm not sure if it went anywhere. But it's actually on having qualifications for the national judges. They have to they have to certain they have to meet certain criteria to be able to judge the national. So we have a list of judges. They have to be what is it, Larry? Four they have to be regular judges for four years and then you get put on the list. Five, five years, then you get put on six. Okay, so you get put on the list. And then from there then, then so anybody can judge. As long as you're a college judge, anybody can judge. As long as you're a member, yeah, of the CC of A. But for to, and that's not but for the national judges, maybe they should have to have certain criteria beyond being a regular college judge. And that's what I think should be changed in the CCA, that the, there should be certain criteria to be able to judge the national. I agree, totally. I mean, you know, we've seen a lot of bad judging at the national. I mean, really bad judging. Uh, and it's really a shame. I mean, at that level, you know, we really need to be careful on how we choose our judges. I mean, I see judges that come up, and I'm like, really? I mean, they've not bred anything. Just like Cindy said, it's like, come on, you know? Let's, I know we need new judges, we need more judges and all that, but let's please pick judges that 
have great something, have created a family, or have, you know, d done something for the breed, you know. But I don't know. I, I really think there should be some criteria set for national judges, and we've talked about that before uh, on, when I was on the board. Uh, it's gone nowhere at this point, but somewhere down the line, I really think it needs to happen.
and five champions and four litters. Okay. So the 12 years is fine then. I'd say raise the champions to 10 champions. Okay. And then back to the national, I think that it should, I think you should be, to judge the national, I think you should be in the, nat or you should be in uh, 25 years, 25 years. Be a quarter century mem member to judge the national. And, and breed, so, I mean, 20, okay. 20 champions. I need mean, wants to ask a question too, so we'll let her do it, if you're okay with that, Kathy? Yeah. Okay. okay. So I have an opinion on how AKC can improve our judges, which I think um, our judges Ed should have to test our judges for, for colleagues. So maybe it's at an actual show where they are like a field rep, because I'm sorry, field reps, they do procedure, they know a little bit about our breed, they don't know the details. I think Judges Ed should be a part of testing our judges before they have access to judge our dogs. I think um, judges need, potential judges need to hear honest feedback on, no, that's not the right dog, that's not the right winner. Um, how they do that, whether it's a mock show or it's an actual show, whatever, I think we should have hands-on tests where we have, where we have to um, be put on, held on, held accountable for our decisions and why we're coming up to them. And it needs to be somebody in our judges' head. Or do you see I, I really feel, I really do it over in Europe. You need to um, just say why you did it. Yeah, say why you did it. And to say that this dog moved good and the dog was cow hot, what an idiot. You made yourself look like an idiot. You know, they should be they should be accountable for what they do. And not just say, well, I liked them. Why? If you're judging this breed, every little detail from our standard should be in your head while you're analyzing that dog in front of you. Instead of just saying, well, I liked him. That's no excuse. I have a comment, and this was something that I commented on years ago. I said that after, when a specialty judge or a specialty club picks a judge, it should be part of the contract that at the end of the show, the judge would stand up with his winners and talk about them while well, everybody stood there and didn't pack up their crap and say, this dog was my best of breed because I found this and this and this. I mean, these are your winners. You should be able to tell what virtues you saw in them. I don't want to go home after I went to a dog show and say, what the hell were they looking at? Let the judge say, this was my winner because I found this and this and this. And you can sit there and look at it, and if they're full of crap, you're going to know, I mean, you know, have, what are you going to say when you watch the dog move across the ring and it was crippled? It doesn't take long. It would take, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. Just the winners, not the whole show. But this was my reserve dog. I liked this, but I felt like the winner's dog had a little bit better this. You would know what the judge thought. And if you're not willing to say why you put them up, then you shouldn't be judging. Hey, Judy. We're thankful that the CCFA, we do that CCFA, every judge has to be accountable for what they've done. It's a lot of things to be accountable for, a lot of classes. But you know, when you do it after the fact, when you do this kind of thing after the fact, which is what happened in, you know, with colleague expressions, which is nice that they let the judge write the critique, it's all over. It doesn't answer the questions for the people that were there at the show and saw it. How hard is it to say, just put the dog up there that you gave the breed to. If I loved this dog because his outline was beautiful. I loved his expression. You don't have to go into you know great detail, but you better talk about, because there's a reason why you put it up or why you didn't. You know, when you have hours or weeks or months to think about, 
number one, if you're honest, you forgot about what half of them look like unless they were your class winners, and if you're lucky. You know, you, and the people who were there at the show at least would know what you were thinking, and that way you'd know whether or not to bother with them again if they were stupid. <laughs> Well, there's plenty of time. We have an entry of 20. There's plenty of time to talk. They, they always say, well, it's not enough time. Well, you have like these shows with like maybe 60 total entry. There's plenty of time to say why you like that dog way to Yeah. If you have someone ringside and you explain, and you have to do that in Europe when you judge in yeah, Europe. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's hard to find a good one, but it's okay. Um, but when you're standing ringside, and so you're in the ring, and you pick this dog, and you say, oh, I like this dog, I wonder what he liked about it. And you say, I picked this dog because he has a very clean head, and look at this scar. So the people outside the ring will say, oh, well, I liked this dog, but a stop was on the end of his nose. Maybe that's the difference, and that's what I should be looking at, because we're still missing the newcomers because they don't know what to look for. And I think a lot of new judges are a little insecure when they first start. If you cannot take criticism, do not get your license. Because it, it is hard. You come home and they rip you to shreds, and they're ready for it. And I go, oh, I'm ready for this. You know what I mean? But don't, if you are insecure, don't do it. Because if you're insecure, you'll do the wrong thing in the ring. on every dog and it's a pain in the butt, number one. Number two, half the time the dogs 
are not that terrific and you don't want to have to rip them apart. But I think that it's important for a judge who puts up dogs at the show to, for his winners. These are the dogs that he found that had virtues, and it, which is the difference between you know, looking and writing about every dog that you saw in the ring. Nobody wants to do that who's judging. That's really a pain in the can, trust me. You know, but how, how hard is it for you to talk about the dogs? Obviously, you must have liked them if you put them up. And if you didn't like them, you should not put them up. Then you don't have to deal with it. But it doesn't take long to my best to breed, my best opposite. This was my select bitch. You don't put up a select. Well, they get the idea that it wasn't that terrific. The virtues of the dogs that, you know, that you see, it shouldn't be that... You know, what would it take, 15 minutes? What do you think to do this kind of thing? That was my that was my suggestion 10, 15 years ago. I think it would be easy. I would be happy to do it. How many people who judge collies here would think about, would be willing to want to do that kind of thing after their assignment? Put up your hand. Getting back to the original question there, um, we have signed a couple of contracts um, where we were required to write critiques um, and actually a few to give a little presentation at the end. So that isn't unprecedented in, in the collie breed right now. There's a few clubs doing that. Um, personally, I hold myself to the responsibility of writing a critique for every assignment. Um, it isn't fun. Um, I don't enjoy it. However, there's no way people are gonna understand or begin to learn unless they're hearing that feedback. Um, however, and I think Larry and I have talked about this in the past, um, fortunately more often than not, we're going through assignments and we're sometimes forced to put up dogs we don't like to top wins. Writing that critique is hard. You know, you're having to kind of pull out just, you know, maybe it was just a virtue, maybe it was just an expression that, you know, went over the top. Um, those are hard critiques to write. Um, and I know personally, I have been attacked for how honest I've been in critiques. So realize what you're asking, and it's a fair ask, but then also understand not everybody's going to be able to be willing to put themselves out there and look down the gun barrel when they give an honest um, critique. So it's a fair ask, but realize what you're asking. showing up at a show and it's hard. Is this an all breed or a specialty? What's that? Even at specialties? Well, maybe if most of the people decided they were going to go to the specialties and not the all breeds. If you're having a hard time getting, you have two, okay, that's fine. because if the judge, if it's an all-rounder. I personally hate showing under all-rounders. I, I, I just there's five clubs in the state. There's five clubs in the state of Texas. Okay, yeah, but I mean, if, if the five clubs would get together and maybe show up at those specialties get, and, and get the judges that will draw all of these people together. Right, but who are they? There have to be respected judges. Okay. And people still don't show under them?
So you're still having trouble getting majors at specialties. Oh, maybe the, 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 the specialties need to get together and think about this. Who belongs to various uh, Texas collie clubs? Can anyone say they haven't got majors at their, at their local specialty shows? And what club is yours? Are they in unison on the weekends? I suggest to find the best, honest judges lineup you can find, and you will drag them in those, 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 that, those that entry. Someone who has never judged outside of a sweeps ring 
absolutely does not have the ability to do a great job at the national in the collie breed when you're dealing with hundreds of dogs. You walk into a small breed, a national that might have 50 or 60 dogs, quite possibly, but not the collie national. That's a different problem. to give back, you get your license and do something about it and change what is going on now. Yeah, and, and, I don't fall for that. And I have to tell you that I did, I mean, it, it, it takes commitment. And, you know, knowing knowing going into this, um, I, I fully expect to get Shelties after, because I, I have just as much experience in Shelties as, as I do in the Collies. Um, but going 
going into that, um, this whole judging process, much more strict than people think. Um, going to a specialty, you pretty much realize the clubs are on an unlimited budget. I'm, I, am, I realize I'm going to be footing, when I go out and, and, and do get judging assignments, I'm going to be footing part of my bill. Connie, I, I, Connie, I know you, you've gone through it. How much have you invested so far? Oh, right. This um, I probably I'm probably looking at a thousand probably a year because each you realize you got each test each breed it costs you money to take the breed standard test and I mean and their tests are now electronic and they're not easy when I say they're not easy the answers are in the book but they they question them I don't has anyone ever done slaughterhouse matching. Everyone now, that's when, okay, it's when you're, when you're in college and the prof professor really wants to humble you. And they do a slaughterhouse matching where you may have more than one answer that's correct. It may be all the answers. But if you don't answer the right correct, they count that off as well. It, it's, you could end up with a minus, okay? <laughs> now, AKC is not quite that bad, but it's bad when the, you look at those. Because some of the questions, some of the answers are close to right, but they're not the right answer. So you gotta be really, really careful when you take these tests. So I'm telling you, AKC is really, really making a difference. The Judges Institute, spectacular for anyone. I mean, I can't believe they have not had this up prior. Um, Tim, Tim's the one, um, Tim Thomas, Tim Thomas. Tim Thomas is the one that, that does the instruction with that. And I had to, I mean, I had to fly up to South Carolina to take the test at one of the shows. And it's a full day, you gotta, and you gotta take off work, you gotta to stay at the hotel, and if you're doing juniors, which you wanna do juniors, that's a, a, another day added on to it. Okay. But they do a great job. Great. Yeah. Actually, I, I just had a thought about um, uh, AKC Provisional, all re judges. Um, I think it's important that if, if you can be objective and look, and look at the entry, what you have and what else is there, and the judge, a provisional judge, actually finds the right one. I think it's, I think it's important on your part to go up and congratulate that provisional person for finding that animal. If it's like some little kid that was like falling all over, it wasn't trimmed or whatever. But if it was the right animal, they need to have some positive feedback. Now, if while you're getting pictures or whatever, they ask you, well, what about my winner's bitch? And they were like way off. If they ask, we'll tell them. But if they don't ask. But I think it's important that uh, the provisional judges know if they get it right, they need to know. trimming or no trimming okay this sets the higher level of a true breeder judge they can see through a horrible handler they can see through bad grooming and such I remember years ago James Mangle showed to me I showed a, a bitch of Pam's he didn't like what I did he took the lead from me and he baited the dog himself. He went, yo, where's bitch? Boom. He knew the potential of that, that bitch, but I wasn't giving it to him. Those are great breeder judges. I'm, I don't want to hear a judge going, well, he was behaving badly. And blah, 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 oh, give me a break. You can see, can't you, see, you, can't you see a beautiful dog with a bad handler? Oh, you can yeah. still see the quality, Larry, same thing. You can yeah. see it. Those are the judges. You need to be judging dogs, not making excuses. They're not behaving themselves, blah, blah, blah. I get handling lessons in the ring to people because I know what I want to see. Jerry, very much like James Mangles did to me. He probably could take a lead from my hand. He pulled it from my hand, judging my dog. And we need judges like that, not just say, oh, I don't look at your top line. I'd say, ma'am, please fix your top line. You're not giving me what, what I want to look at. You know what I mean? She's not clairvoyant. She can't see that the dog is saying, you know, she's a little nervous. Give him a break. These judges need to, to really concentrate on 
the great virtue of what's before them without saying, making an excuse why they didn't do it, okay? We're gonna wrap up very soon, but I have a couple, I have one more question that'll make them squirm. You excited? Okay. Some people will say, you have it all, but some don't know the story sometimes. Tell us your most difficult moment in dogs. Because people think, because we, we're notable people, that we don't, we don't cry the same way, we don't weep the same way. We've experienced a lot of crap breeding these dogs, disappointments. New people, I'm out of dogs, I, I just can't deal with this, and they're out. Die hard people, we want die hard, these are all die hards here, okay? Um, Larry, you have a mic in your hand, almost. Can you answer that question for us? Some people will say, you have it all, but no one really knows the whole truth. Tell us your most difficult, difficult moment in dogs. Oh, that's kind of hard, but uh, probably my biggest disappointment, if you want to call it that, I mean, that's, I guess, part of it, um, was I was never really able to blend my old family with my new family. Back in, you know, Grace Cosham and I had a family of Blue Merles. We had a lot of Blues, a lot of champions. My first 10 champions were Blue Merles. Um, and, you know, life gets in the way. I was still young, and, you know, so Grace was kind of getting out of it, you know, whatever. But I did have a couple of bitches from that Blue family, and then I bought an outside bitch from Joyce Hauser, uh, who was uh, an apparently uh, daughter, granddaughter actually, and uh, had planned to breed or integrate those two families, and but that never happened. So unfortunately, life got in the way, and I was never able to integrate that family. However, my current current family all goes back to the Twin Creeks bitch. Now I'm on 14 generations back from that particular bitch. And unfortunately, the original family died off, you know, because I farmed some of them off here and there, and the breeding, we bred them, and the quality, you know, for various reasons. But uh, unfortunately, I was able, never able to integrate the two families, and that was my original plan. So that's my, that's my probably the biggest disappointment. Sometimes when you breed a litter or breed a bitch and it doesn't take, that's a disappointment. Uh, sometimes I've, I've had disappointments with having uh, a pig puppy, what I consider a pig puppy in a litter, and maybe it, it died, you know, puppies in the litter that they saw. Um, I've had three champion bitches that I never got anything out of that, you know, they, they finished and then I bred them. They never produced anything. They just never got pregnant. So... I think one of the di biggest disappointments is when you have an outstanding individual and um, in, in whatever show it is or whatever series of shows or if, if, if there's a, kind of a lull in the career of a dog that, that you know he's in great condition, he's going great, um, things are, the, the judging lineup looks great, but it just doesn't happen. And it doesn't. It doesn't keep. It doesn't keep going. It doesn't keep going. I mean, it's, it's. It's. There's this arc, and then it's this, and then it's this, and then it's this, and it's the, the downward times that you really appreciate those clients that are that understand and, and get get the whole get the big picture. Um, and there's been many times we've had class animals. And this is going to show these or collies that um, you'll have these mediocre ones go through like like clockwork. And then you've got this beautiful animal that maybe it's a little freaky, or it's a little this, or it's a little that, but it should be appreciated. It's got things that absolutely need to be, need to be seen and need to be appreciated. That can be really frustrating. If it's freaky and it's, it's just kind of a mediocre one, 
it's no big deal. But if it really means something to you, it is beautiful. And there's things about it that, that need to be seen, and it isn't, and you're hitting your head up against the wall because it doesn't always happen. That's really, it's, it's really disappointing, but the, uh, the owners that stay with you and understand, it's, that's greatly appreciated. Let's see if I can get through this. As breeders, every single one of us, we've all had, you cry, you cry for every win that you see. There's 10 times the tears that went into that before you even got that win. Regardless, um, winning the national was, that is like winning the Kentucky Derby. I will be honest with you, but that is the Kentucky Derby of all shows to win. And there is no feeling like it. Right? Trey? Yeah. yeah. April? Right? Um, the worst thing for me, like I said, other than, the, you know, you lose puppies, you have a bitch that piles that you had a lot of hope for. You got a lot of things that happen. Stud dogs, they're not producing in the summer when the bitches come in, you name it. To me, one of the biggest heartbreaks is, and it's always been my rule, is I brought each dog that we have and that we keep, I brought it into this world. I was there when it was born. It's my duty to be there when it's time for them to go. And that's one of the things that I have promised every single dog that I've had at my place. It is the worst, it is the worst, yet it is the most comforting feeling to know that you were there for them the, their entire lives. Um, and I will tell you the other biggest disappointment is when you lose your partner in dogs. That's been there, excuse me guys. It's been three years since I lost my mother. You lose your partner in dogs, who was there with you every step when you first started, cheered you on. She was there, the one that groomed. She was there helping me. She, I still hate the chalk legs. She just was like the best chip leg chalker you ever did see. Um, to lose her um, was probably the biggest thing. And I'm lucky that I have another sister of my heart that helps me with it and help me get through it. Um, I will say that when my mother passed, and this is to, to add some levity to it, when, when, we, when we, our old dogs go, we always, we, we have them cremated and they come back in a pretty little box. When mom passed, <laughs> um, we sent at least eight dogs with her. <laughs> <laughs> And her favorite slicker, because mom was always known to have her slicker, and she was always ringside with that slicker to brush up the coat. And um, the poor lady at the funeral home was like, you want this to go in there too? And this one? And this one? <laughs> but I have to tell you that I know and I have comfort knowing that Dobson and all the other ones, they're with home. <laughs> so there's my disappointment. for years, there's several disappointments. Um, losing an entire litter, huge. I think the biggest disappointment was in a litter that I bred, I kept two out of ten puppies. Um, one of them was a tri dog. His name was Seal. It's just one night, and I kept a blue bitch. Um, Seal was Pixel design. I gave Danny a blue bitch um, just because I love him. And there was another blue bitch in that litter that I loved. Her headpiece it was beautiful, beautiful headpiece. And I, she had a bad wear, and I couldn't 
couldn't do it. I just that's a pet peeve of mine is a bad rear. And that was a mistake. I should have kept that bitch. And that was my own disappointment um, because I wasn't willing to compromise to keep that beautiful face that I knew was right. I was just being stubborn. Um, and I know everybody has issues about showing a dog that has won the national. They feel it should be retired immediately. Um, put it away, won the national. You don't take it anywhere else but a national again. So in 92, when I won, under Billy Ashenbrenner, who I feel is probably one of the best judges that's ever been in the breed. Um, the following year, I went to the National in Oklahoma City. Um, I was advised to have another person show grand applause, but I, it was my ego. I didn't want to give my dog to somebody else to show. I did not make first cut out of it. That's a disappointment because I let my ego get in the way of what was best for that dog. I can't, I guess the judge could be to blame, but I let my ego get in the way. So don't let that happen. I'm gonna leave it at that. You know, it's impossible to just pick one. Um, some hurt worse than others. Some hurt for years. Um, it was hard as a teenager, scraping all the money you possibly had to make a breeding to have the puppies born and listen to them scream all night long as they're dying one by one. Um, it's hard to hear your character and your ethics questioned and aligned when you know you did what was right. It's hard to have your heart dog taken from you. But my experiences are no greater, no worse than everything you've heard here. I think what's important is what you do with it. And if you're going to truly be great, you need to realize this is part of it. You're going to have your heart ripped out time and time again but it's what you do with those experiences. And never give up. Be persistent. Keep grinding. When you're down, take your time to mourn. Take your time to lick, lick your wounds. And then get busy. And start putting together your plan to come back. I think everybody has had these experiences and uh, I'm not going to cry, trust me, because 50 years of doing this I've had the bitches that reabsorbed and had a pyometra and the puppies that have died. One of my biggest disappointments was leasing a really beautiful dog and ending up having him years ago before we had the testing become, he'd be a PRA carrier and the test breeding was so hard and I had beautiful daughters of this dog and no way to test breed them and I had to end up sell them, selling them as pets to be spayed and neutered because there wasn't any way that I could go on and not know what I was going to come up with from that and I think that you know when you have a dream and it goes down the drain and it, it was a plan that you had and you knew it was going to be a success and you end up at a dead end. All you can do is just pick yourself up and start all over again and uh, you know that you can be sure that if you're going to be in this for 50 years you everybody here is going to have their their heartache and uh, you know it's what you do with it and that's the way you get over it. I, I guess I'll 
we've all had our hard lucks. And, um, you know, back in 01, my tri dog won the national. I felt he had superior structure. Something that I, sorry, that I hold high regard is that beautiful structure. And two years later, he had testicular cancer, it had to be noted. That dog could not give me that spectacular movement anymore. You know, you, 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 you know, to breed dogs, you must have a superior passion for what you believe in. I lay at night, I'm sure we all lay at night, thinking of these breedings in our head, I could just, marry those two dogs together and I accomplished it you know and have that ripped away from you after you know, probably 25 years of having a vision in your head of what you want so I want to tell everyone we felt the pain that all of you have felt maybe you're new in the breed which um, sorry to really make you feel down but you know but our love for it surpasses the heartache that we have experienced. And there are some times that I want to just say, you know what, I'm done. Because my love, my passion was ripped away from me and I have no idea how to get it back. But I moved on and trying to duplicate that dog has not happened yet. But when, they ha when it happens, oh my God, you think the almighty Lord that it is coming back again. So I want to let you know, you know, we've, we've done very well, but we, we feel the pain that all of you have felt. It's not just you and you and you. We have felt it generation after generation, decades by decades. So I wanted, I, I formed this question because I wanted you to know that we feel it too. We feel the pain every time we have a litter and we lose it. We have stud dogs that can't even utilize it anymore after they had just won the national. It's, it saddens you, and it, and it takes you, like Matt said, you sit there, you need a good month, maybe two, maybe six months, you can go to a dog show, and to see some of the offspring that they have produced that I might could have had, it's really heart-wrenching, you know? But we, we, we persevere. And that's why we're still doing this. That's why we still love the breed. But I want, any more questions, actually, before we, um, anyone? Well, I want to thank our wonderful panel who have gone above and beyond to answer these great questions. Larry, Kathy, Nick, Connie, Annette, Matt, and Tudor. to get out in 100 degree weather and go, oh my God, it's so hot. But I want to thank all of you. Because all of you can move the breed forward. I hope that some of what people had said today has sunk in. Maybe a bell went off in your head. Oh, wow, you know, I get it now, I get it. We've all experienced these horrible heartbreaks. But we've had wonderful wins and experiences and they brought joy to our lives. Okay, so thank you again for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone from the audience want to ask some questions? No hands raised? Come on now. Yes? I had to step away from the breed for a long time due to family situations when I came back to the National, I, well, the last one in the house, whenever that was, that was the first one I've been to in like 10 years. Um, I was really surprised at some of the things I saw and some of the things I didn't see. And I think my perspective, having had to step away, was very different. One of the very first things I noticed was that every bitch that I really liked was a dog. Um, that was the very, in fact, I think I spoke to you about that there. Um, so that was one thing that I noticed was we had lost our stallions. Um, the other thing that I've noticed was the fronts, the short upper arm. Um, and I think that at this 
this year's national. I, I was disappointed. I think we saw more bad movement than good movement, and I'm not quite sure what your thoughts are. I mean, I know where you stand on looking at fronts and stuff, but I think we're losing things that we, we feel are very valuable, and I don't know if it's because new people are coming in without the knowledge of the, the back reading or without the knowledge of what's important, or do they just not feel that it's important? And I guess you know, my question kind of falls on, where do you think we should go from here? I start you Oh, I, I have Larry. Sorry, Larry? Oh. I don't know. I mean, quite honestly, I don't know. It, it's really sad, and you're correct. Movement sucks. I mean, come on, people. You know, I do see the way people, some of the breeders, some of our top breeders even, they select puppies, they look at them in the, in the X-Pen, they look at them in the face, and they go over their heads, they never see them move. They don't, or they don't really so, select on movement or structure. That's pretty evident, you know, and you're right, the national, I mean, you can see it all there. I mean, it's awful. So I really do think, you know, come on, we're going to have to do a better job on our bodies. I mean, eye and expression and head and all that is, is very important, but so are bodies. I mean, our standard is a complete standard. We have one of the best standards ever written, but doesn't mean we ignore structure, soundness, movement. That's all very important, and that's part of the way the dog holds himself, his carriage. I mean being a stallion, like if it's a male, I mean, I totally agree with that terminology. We don't see a lot of stallion type dogs anymore. So, I think we're in trouble. I mean, you know, you really, we need to get it together. Come on, people. Um, <laughs> I, I agree. At the National this year, there was such poor moving dogs, dogs that crossed over the front Collies that crossed over in the rear. I was just real surprised. Um, tail sets, that's another thing. It's just groups ain't right. Um, so we really do need to do something about that. I think from a handling perspective, we get um, it's easier to finish thing, these things that are generic, uh, go around in a generic way that are kind of square, um, nothing to extreme and we keep talking about the uh, standing over the ground in this elegant this, this big stallion shape um, how many of us are willing to wait for that that's not going to happen when they're 18 months old i mean that's not going to be when they're 12 months old that's not going to happen at two years old i mean you're going to have this big frame that's going to have no meat to it and it's not going to win and it shouldn't win at that point so how many of us are willing to wait on an animal to come together to have great promise at four when you've got this cute little generic thing that can go out at, you know, a year old, if it's got hair, run around the ring, stand four square and finish. Now, is that a solution? No, it's the problem. So, what, what's, the, what's the solution? I don't know what the solution is, other than we do need to concentrate on our bodies and our movement. And um, I know that with a lot of shows that I've gone to, a lot of times, the collie never shows up in the group. It doesn't. It, the collie does not show up in the group. They leave because they're like, you know, we're not going to win it anyway. Well, you're not going to win it because your body and your structure is not there. If you want to play with the big guys, you've got to get your own big guy. So, you know, they have got to have the legs, and it's something you've got to concentrate on. And it's, it is very much important. As much as the head is, they've got to have the legs. They can do a little bit, I, I will allow a little bit of this and just a little bit of that, but they better single track and they better move beautiful on the, on the go ground. Um, all of that just goes in together for what we're striving for on an individual dog. Um, you just don't settle for mediocre. Every bit is important. 
And it's not saying expression isn't. But we can't compromise or sacrifice one for the other. And we need to let new people understand, don't stop at the head. How do we go forward with this? Well, if you're mentoring these new people, you need to explain to them what good movement is. So make sure you know what good movement is, for one. Um, if you don't, if you can't show it to them from what you have, then you need to find a dog that you can show them good movement. It doesn't even have to be a collie. Show them good movement on a different breed that, you know, it's not supposed to move short and square. They need to have the reach and drive, single track. Um, but yeah, it's, if you aren't educating these new people on what good movement is, what rip spring is, what a croup is, they're not going to learn. I guess I don't see this as a recent change. I, mean, I, re I remember going to the Midwest specialties in the uh, early 90s and just being appalled at the movement of every dog. So I, I think the pendulum does swing a little bit based upon the popular stud dogs of the day and what their movement issues are. Then the puppies look like that. Um, but the breed hasn't moved in decades. So um, how do you fix it? I mean, it, it's prioritizing it. There's very few dogs that are going to be even capable of producing a good shoulder. Um, you know, um, give my regards was a dog that he was capable of improving shoulders. And breeders, when you see that, you're going to have to emphasize that in your breeding program and try to go get it. Um, although I think I tried to breed the dog four times and never got a puppy, but... <laughs> um, I also want to pick up on something that Nick said. I see that a lot more often, is kind of that generic safe square. Um, when you have a dog that is square and doesn't have the angulation, um, it's real easy to get a dog to single track when it can only reach this far, or if it can only push that far. Um, as you get that extension in the rear, well, it might not be a perfect single track. Um, I'll take that every time to get that true extension, that short hock, and the correct, uh, you know, stifle action. So, um, how do you fix it? You're going to have to find those dogs that are, they're not going to be dominant for those things. You're just looking for one that's going to be capable of producing one or two and then emphasize that in your selection. Well, I think we had a really good example at our national this year and at Westminster this year of the dog that moved so beautifully that I was so impressed to see Fiero in the group. And I have to say that I think that if everybody watches to see how a dog like that can move and but this, these are the kind of things we need to see these good moving dogs that show what our breed can do, how they can reach and drive. And, uh, you know, if we don't have examples like that that go out there and, and, and get awarded for their movement, we're not going to see them. I think one of the sad things that we saw at our national this year was the number of bad tails and fixed tails that we saw and that faking that goes on that's really disappointing in our breed if they if, you know you have to learn how to breed them correctly first instead of just trying to fix the what you call the problem let's have some education on what really beautiful movement and side gate is and you know and focus on those dogs that can do it we're going to break soon, but I want to add. Yes, yes, great. Yeah, I'd like As breeders, you know you need to build on that one thing. As breeders, if you know you need good fronts, for instance, and your family already has the expressions you want and you're dominant and you've got a good strong line point, would you be afraid to breed to a dog that maybe isn't something you necessarily like, except you know he produces great fronts? Would you go in, get that front, and get out? Would, wouldn't that would that be worth it to you? I have an answer for that. <laughs> I have not necessarily fronts, but I had the type of dog that I really liked in the 70s and the 80s. But I really was looking. I mean, they had the overall picture that I wanted. They had the head. They had the expression. 
I wanted a different body, so I looked for a dog that had the outcross for me that I thought that I could use. And I really liked the Gambit dogs. I liked Freeze Frame. I thought he was a really beautiful dog. But I really, I focused, when I judged the National, I had a class there and I had a six to nine puppy that was a champion Gambit, a hurricane grew and he wasn't a champion at that time. He was just a beautiful puppy and I had judged his mother and saw the beautiful face that that mother had and the puppy was pretty. And I worked my butt off to lease him, to get him to come back to my kennel. And I felt like he changed the whole, what you want, the whole problem that I was looking at with the rears. Not that, you know, I mean, you wish that you could get everything. But, you know, when you need a virtue, you have to find a family that's strong in that virtue that's not going to bring you a whole lot of problems that you don't want to bring in. I mean, this is always a risk, but you want to focus on that virtue, and then you want to select the puppies from that litter that you get from the outcross, and look for the ones that carry the virtue that you wanted, and hopefully don't carry anything that, you know, that you can't live with, so that you can take that back into your line. That's the only way you're going to improve. So you need to know what you're looking for in your movement. Do you want a good front? Find a family of dogs that's strong in that virtue. F try and find a dog that's line bred to those dogs in that family that's not going to bring you a big problem. And take the risk because that's the way that you make a line. You bring it back into your own. Then you select from there and you know and look for the virtues. You can change. You can change anything if you work hard enough at it. I think. Uh, short answer to the question: Absolutely. Um, I know we've taken a couple of swings for the fences for doing exactly that. Um, unfortunately, our batting average probably isn't what we wish it would be. Um, but one thing I'm. Um, I almost will not miss a class at the National. The biggest thing that I'm looking for, um, in addition to that dog, is looking what other breeders have done in crossing families, trying to find those nicks. There's been a lot of dogs we wanted to breed to that were strong in an area of need for us, but we also knew that dog was not going to cross well with our family. So um, you can learn a lot from watching what other breeders do. Let them be your your sandbox to figure out, hey, does this family cross with that one, and can you get that virtue or that family of virtues out? Um, because a family may be dominant for it, but it does, if it doesn't cross with your family, you're spinning your wheels. Um, but if presented with the opportunity, absolutely. Before we have a next speak, we have to have a break. Even wants to do a little break, everyone can get a drink or something. But we're, we're going to go back to Craig. Remember your question? We'll start with Annette when we return. Okay? Great. Thank you.
get what you need, whether it's a lay back and shoulder, breeding to a dog that you know is dominant for that, you know will throw that, but you're breeding into unknown territories everywhere else. But because your family's so strong, you can go back into your own family to get the type that you want. Annette? My answer to that would be absolutely. If you are not willing to take the risk, you will not progress. You can't improve if you stay where you are. You can't get anywhere without getting on that plane. Okay. You fall off the horse, you get back on the saddle. That's it. Um, definitely, and, and as evident, Cindy and I have done that. We've gone out to grab certain things. The only thing that I say is when you go out and do an outcross to bring something back in, don't choose the puppy in the litter that's got to set your same fault. You just made that breeding for a reason. So you're choosing that puppy out of that breeding that, that has whatever character you're trying to correct. To make sure you choose that puppy that has that attribute, the whole reason you made the, the outcross in the first place. But yes, it, it, and if I do that, that's what we did, but it still comes down to us evaluating the puppies and they still have to move. I think you would definitely have to be open to that, but it also depends to me on um, the degree to which the other family you're talking about you'd be willing to outcross to. Are they line bred on really ugly faces? Are they line bred on bucket heads? Are they line bred on saggy lips? Um, if that's the case, I, I don't think I could do it. I mean, actually, I have to say that there's no way I could do it. But it depends on what else. If you're looking at attractive heads, you know, light, lean heads, and, and a different style. Well, I mean, if you need, if you need to get a better shoulder, I mean, you're not. It's not going to happen sitting in your kennel. Obviously, if you identify that as your problem. But if the other family is really, you're really going to sacrifice, take a real hit on eyes and. Uh, right. 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 No. 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 So. Um. You know, my pitches have always been real important. Like, you know, and soundness has really been important for me. I've got to have a great structured movement and all. But I bred out to uh, a family for say like eyes or expression, but then I always bring back into my family because it's like not never breeding away from soundness. I have to have something sound, you know, to breed out. You know, if I'm breeding out, I've bred out to dogs that maybe wasn't quite so sound, but I've bred out for like eyes, and then I would breed right back in to soundness. Is, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I, like, there's, if you don't take risk, you don't get anywhere. And you've got to, uh, you know, if you need good structure and, and movement, you know, you can do an outcross, but you, like Connie said, you have to make sure that you select in that your puppies according to what you went to, went to do the outcross for. So, yeah, absolutely, I would outcross to pick up virtues that I don't have. And then next generation, you know, kind of blend it back in. I want to touch back on what Cheryl had said. Um, I was going to say it, and then Greg jumped out because he has top priority. Um, about things of the national, I just judged it. You probably saw me all there. And you probably read my critique in the bulletin. It wasn't that I was trashing these dogs. I was talking to you about dogs. And I think that is what's missing today. Everything turns into a trashing debris. Everything is debris, trash, trash, trash. Shut your mouth and start talking dogs again. And that's how we want to get this breed back on track, okay? okay? And Shut your mouth when a mentor is talking. Stop going, did you hear what that bee said to me? You know what? These people are your parents. You are the student. 
And believe me, you start listening to this nagging from your mother, you become your mother. You remember that? God, I like that. I like my mother or my father. But guess what? They knew what they were doing. These people know what they're doing. They've done it. They swept the floor. They cleaned it. It's our job to continue to clean the house for them. Okay? Stop taking everything as an insult. Because people love, that's discrimination. It's not discrimination. They have steered the ship for years. They know the course. Stop listening and stop judging them for telling you what they know. Okay? A, a teacher told me years ago that no one is greater than you. The only thing they have on you is the time it took you to learn what you know. They have the time. That was time for you to learn it. And stop thinking, what the heck do they know? I've won two breeds. Big deal. Under what competition? Five dogs? These people have won under 30, 50, 60 dog entries. They have it going on. You're competing with five dogs. Okay? Not being mean, I'm just being truthful about this. Okay? Next question. Before we start, anyone in the audience? Yes. Sorry. Okay. So my question has not been addressed at all here. And everybody here has talked about how pretty they should look, their physical structure. I haven't heard much or anything mentioned about some of the things in our breed that are health issues and how much you would weigh some line that might have some health issue, whether it's thyroid, uh, skin disorder, some other disorder that you know is in that line, would you be willing to breed for better structure, knowing it's got some health issue? Would you have a sense of responsibility for calling out this gorgeous dog that comes down? Maybe you don't know until they're three or four, but it has a health issue. Would you be willing to come forward and say, I need to stop with this gorgeous dog because it's got some health issue in it. In other words, what weight would you put on a health issue versus a physical attraction or something like that? Larry? Well, I mean, you've got to have health. I mean, that's bottom line. I mean, you don't have a good collie or you don't have a good line or a family of dogs if the health is not there. So, yeah, that comes first and foremost. Uh, you got to have that. You've got to have good doers, dogs that are eat well, they're easy keepers, uh, you know, all of that is, is important. A temperament, all of those basics, those to me are just basic things you've got to have in a family of dogs. Everything else is built on that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, if I had a dog that had a health issue or discovered that there was a health issue, I'd take him off. you let people know that you have a dog that has a health issue or whatever? Right. Well, personally, I don't really breed to a lot of outside bitches or sell puppies to show homes. For me, that's not really an issue. But, um, well, it really depends on, yeah, if people bred to my stepdog or, or whatever and he's producing BRA or whatever, sure. I mean, yeah, you'd have to do that. Um, and other issues as well. I mean, yeah, you would have to. But I don't worry about that because I don't. I don't really breed a lot of outside bitches. Well, the health question is a good question, and uh, I can say myself personally, um, I, I don't deal with any. I mean, I wouldn't deal with any health issues. Yeah, I, I wouldn't if, I, if it was thyroid or whatever. I, I just, it would be gone from my breeding program because I try to breed the healthiest and, and hopefully be known for that. Um, I did years ago, I had bred one of my champion bitches to a, uh, to a, a dog and there was some, um, uh, uh, not from my uh, 
ditch that I kept, but then she became the champion. I mean, I finished her and everything, but there was other health issues, and of course, I scrapped her from my grading program. She was gone. I'm sorry. You know, I, I just, if I know of health issues, they would be gone. And the same way with eyes. I'm real um, uh, considering on eyes. I mean, I've never kept anything to breed with coloboma. And, and never say never, but you know, I want good eyes also. I want good eye checks and health. And it's real important for me. I think t today in an age of, uh, of uh, technology and all the tests that are available, I think there's just absolutely no excuse not to test your animals. There's just no excuse. And I think, I think if you're going to run a stud dog, I mean, people like me, uh, that are just kind of starting to kind of feel the waters and look at different dogs out there. Um, that's going to be something that, that matters something to us. Uh, we recently ran into a situation where we're going at a beautiful sable bitch, um, and uh, there was a hip issue. Well, that's out of the picture. Uh, so how long do you have to grow something out before you you find that there's like an issue? It's, it's heartbreaking. It's a waste of your time. And I think uh, I think it's if you're going to run a stud dog. It's, I think people are going to expect the very basic testing. And I, I can't stress that enough. I feel very strongly about that. I mean, that's not, I, I just think that's going, that's going to have to happen in the future. It's going to have to. Well, since my partner is Dr. Cindy, uh, it's, it's good to have a vet as a partner. However, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> um, she's been a wealth of knowledge, too. And she's also helped out our Collie Health Foundation for the club. You know, and, and she has done a lot of, Cindy has done a tremendous amount of work and help for our breed between bloat seminars and all that. So I do want to acknowledge, <laughs> and just keeping that awareness out there, you know, for all of us as breeders. Do I believe in health? Absolutely. Let's, let's do every single test we can. That's what we're actually have been doing. Have we had issues in the past? Absolutely. Um, we had two bitches that were full sisters, bred to the same stud dog, and this is years ago. Um, one litter came up with, was it two puppies with epilepsy in it? I think two puppies in that litter had epilepsy. The money was refunded. We called all the puppy owners, and the other litter, no, no issue whatsoever. Now, I'll be honest with you, looking back on it, it's probably the MVR1 because ours is, ours is pretty much negative, negative, and ours are very sensitive. And since then, we've actually got bred into some dogs that are, that are not negative, so we're getting better with that. But I probably believe that was the original issue. However, how did we handle that at that point in time? We funded money to every single puppy person in that litter, whether they had an affected puppy or not. They got the, their money refunded, the complete entire sum. We took that bitch, put her in a pet home, took her sister, told every single, because the puppies were, none of those other puppies in that second litter were affected, told everybody in there, they let us know if you have any issues with the puppies. We, I hate, I always, it's like fucking bringing bad karma every time you mention anything. But um, no issues, we put that bitch in a pet home, pulled them out of the kennel, and they were champion bitches. But if we run into something and we see something, um, something like that, where it Im impacts the puppy as being a lifelong companion to somebody, because these puppies are supposed to, you know what, they're supposed to live 14 years with these families. And that's what I want my puppies to be, happy and healthy until 14 years of age. So if they're not, we're pulling them out of the breeding program. I don't care if they're champions or not. We're very, very, very firm on that. And um, it's just something you have to stick to as a breeder. But thank goodness, with a lot of what research has been going on, things are getting a lot, lot better. We're able to screen a lot and know if I want to go out to the stud dog, well, what's his MDR1 status? And, you know, and how, have you had any issues? And hopefully, breeders, most of them are, but I'd like to think the positive people will be honest with you. I mentioned before that, you know, all of a sudden, after I, you know, third generation down, all of a sudden, boom, I got a tail that was like, and I'm not used to, I'm not used to having tails up. I am not used to having tails up. They can have their tails up when they're, you know, five, four weeks old, but not when they get older. Um, and found out that the grandmother had a fixed tail. 
Didn't know that when we read. Um, and actually, everything out of those litters, um, even though we finished a bunch, got put in pet homes afterwards also. Um, yeah, as a responsible breeder, if you know your dog has a health issue, it's your responsibility to inform people that are bred to your dog and um, you know, either be selective in how you breed them or just take them out of your program. I hope it hasn't come across because of the topic of conversation today that health is important. Um, from the sounds of it, sounds like I speak for everybody, it's a zero tolerance policy. If you stumble into a health problem, it's gone. Um, I think it is really exciting with the DNA testing coming. Um, in fact, we've got a pack of four, four DNA swabs at home that we're going to be doing this week. It's exciting to begin to test for these new things. Um, and we're all going to stumble into new things here as technology advances. You know, and then it's going to be on all of us to figure out how do we move forward, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, unless it's something really serious, but how do we continue to move forward um, and I think that's the expectation of being a responsible breeder in 2018 and moving forward. Our puppy buyers expect it, and they deserve it now that there's the technology to support them. So uh, health is a major consideration, and we won't deal with dogs with health problems, period. Well, I think that health is very important, and I think that honesty is really important, too. But I don't know that every issue in our breed is worth all the testing that we necessarily do. I don't happen to think that the MDR1 issue is a big deal unless you should have something that is going to need chemotherapy or some of those drugs that we would, that we would have to use for cancer. I really don't feel like we know what drugs collies are sensitive to and stuff like that. I think if you want to do these testings, that's fine. There are other things we need to focus on, like torsion, like bloat, that people are not always honest about that, you know, that gets swept under the table. I think if we have a stud dog that's a public stud, if we know that it produced a problem that's, that could damage the health of our breed, that, and it's not always something that the dog is going to be dominant for, but people deserve to know if you have a dog at stud, if you've had a problem. It's your responsibility as a breeder to say that. I don't know if you guys know what we had to do years ago when we had the big problem with PRA, and we had to get a blind bitch and test breed our stud dogs and the things that we had to go through and the things that we had to do. I leased a dog uh, from another kennel, brought him to the East Coast. He was gorgeous, was one of the most beautiful dogs that I'd ever had there. We knew that his parents were probably fine, but we didn't know something about the pedigree way behind him. Lo and behold, his first litters came and he was, they were like 11 weeks old and they weren't my litter, thank God, but they were falling off a wall or, you know, or not falling down the stairs. And when they were checked, the dog, the puppies were, you know, had PRA. It was really hard for me to have to call everybody who bred to this dog and say, I need to tell you this so that you don't go farther with your program unless you're going to test. I think it's wonderful now that we have a test for PRA and so we can tell this. But, you know, a lot of us have worked really hard to get rid of some of these problems. Honesty is the real important thing in this. You know, and you have to count on the people that you work with, your mentors, the people that you breed from, that they're going to be honest with what they tell you. We can't know everything about all these problems and, you know, which are important, but it's a shame about the things that get swept under the rug sometimes. It's our responsibility to tell the truth. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, oh, a lot of questions. I'm on the breeder of your committee, and I just want to say that um, 
part of the Breeder of the Year Award uh, gives way to genetic testing. And in just a few years that we've had this new system, uh, we've seen a lot more people testing, um, you know, doing HIPS, and DMS, and DM, and, and all of those things. So I just want to say, it's, I think people are doing it more, and I just want to say thank you to those of you that are doing it. Thank you. me to jump in here. I think can tell you a story that happened to me and it makes you, you know, stop and think about some of these things that you want to confess to when it may, may not be a problem. I had a dog named Clarion World Class that was in stud for me for eight years and some puppies from a litter that he had went to an eye clinic by a really respected ophthalmologist there were a lot of other puppies. It wasn't even in our area that, and there were some PRA problems at the time. And one of those puppies, he told the, the owner, probably had PRA. Well, I was hysterical. This is my dog that had produced, he was eight years old. He'd sired champions. He was behind everything I had. I knew everything that was behind him. I didn't believe it. I called the vet on the phone. This was Dr. Rubin. Everybody on the East Coast knows who he is. 
And he said to me at that time, I don't know, this doesn't make, it. I said, you know, you've checked eyes for me for years, you know, from this dog. What it, can this be? What's going on here? He said, well, I don't know. Maybe I made a mistake or whatever. Anyway, they, the puppy, to make the long story really short, the woman kept the puppy for quite a while. It ended up not having PRA. It was some kind of another problem that the the signal didn't get to the brain from the eye or whatever, but it wasn't that problem. But in the meantime, I called everybody in my family of dogs and said, I'm going to tell you what, I don't believe this, but this is a story. This is what could be happening. If you're going to make any decisions about how you breed, take this into count and, you know, and don't do this. But some of these things that we're testing for now, like this problem that uh, that affects dogs that are 10 or 12 years old. I mean, it's really sad that it happens, but how important is it in our grand scheme of things? Is it, we need to just get a handle on some of this stuff and don't go off half cocked. I think the problem is that if you're a breeder and a stud dog owner, you need to be honest with the people that deal with you and tell them what you know and what you think and what might be happening, and then your conscience is clear. And if, you know, if we share the knowledge with each other, we're going to go a lot farther. I think Judy basically said it all. I mean, I have no chance. All right. <laughs> Anyone else in the audience? Any more questions? that normally we're very good friends for 50 years that take longer to mature than some other lines. I think that you have to know your own line of dogs and when they're ready to win and if they're really beautiful. I think in any family, you know, most of the time if a puppy goes out and finishes and does some kind of really special winning, they usually don't fall apart. Other people who have lines that take longer to develop you know, unfortunately for them, need to be older before they really look the part. I don't think there's anything more beautiful than a really mature dog or bitch. And sometimes, you know, I was, I judged a class, and when I judged in uh, Oregon or Washington just recently, and I had two beautiful veteran bitches. One was like nine years old, the other was 12 years old. They were so far above the normal that I was so excited to be able to award them, you know, the breed and the select. And I think it's important that we want our dogs to be able to hold their quality, but I think we have to look at where they're shown and who they win under. You know, a lot of people, years ago when we had dogs that were halfway good and we needed a major to finish, we'd send them to the cornfields or Puerto Rico, and they would finish their championship, but we wouldn't brag about it. We'd just be, oh yeah, that one finished. We're really happy. You know, nowadays, if they win a five-point major on Facebook before they, when they won under, uh, with a judge, who knows what, with four or five dogs from the same kennel and people are bragging about their five point major. It's not the same. It's not, why brag? I mean, it's like, take it all into perspective. They're not all great. 
Lori has a question. Yeah. So as most of you know, I lived in Texas for three years, and the um, counts changed for the district, and um, it came out in the, uh, the magazine that um, you needed four dogs in Mississippi to make a three-point major, right? Four, four animals is a three-point major. I called Tim Thomas in judging operations, and I said, I have a problem with this. And I said, how, how can you award a major win when you have basically nothing to choose from? And I grew up where there were 30, 50, 75 dog entries, and those dogs were winning five point majors. So how do you just, to me it was a quicker road to a championship and not a fair one. Um, and he, his comment to me was, it's your ring, you're judging on the day. If you don't believe the dog is of quality, then you don't, you don't award it. But you can't prejudge before you get there based on the point scale. So my question to you is, all of you have seen the changes in the point scale, you've seen the quality of dogs, we've talked about it today, where the quality is almost inferior, right? So how do we fix that? And how are we honest with ourselves to move the breed forward? We've talked about movement. Judy, I love what you said, that we need to educate, right? So is that an educational seminar? When do we put our egos at the door so that we can talk openly about the dogs that have the short upper arms, that don't have the layback of shoulder, that we don't get offended as breeders. Do you retool your vision? How often do you do that? So I think the whole topic of the confirmation ring, point scale, and so forth, it's a great topic. In a breeding program, it's really a separate conversation. Uh, for the true breeders, what happens in the show ring has essentially no bearing on our breeding decisions. I don't care if the dog won majors at six months, <laughs> finished at five years of age. What probably does matter to me is who it won under and against what. But I would breed to a dog that had never stepped in the ring. I would breed to a national winner. It has no bearing. The question is, do I think they are capable of producing what I'm looking for from them? some of the bigger breeders in the country. 
Um, I won't breed a bitch just because she's in season. Um, like I said before, I'll, I do a breeding to improve the breed. I never want to go backwards. Your selection of what you keep from that breeding, remember why you did it. What did you want to achieve? Don't keep the puppy that looks like everything else in your kennel. Like I said before, go for that virtue. That's the only way you're going to make progress. And you need to educate yourself. There's people that have been breeding dogs for 30, 40 years that still don't know what good movement is. They don't want to know what correct eye placement is. And they're judges. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Um, when I was a kid, I never went to an all breed dog show. I only went to specialties. I grew up seeing the cream of the crop. Um, and going to an all breed dog show was a very eye opening experience. Um, you learned other aspects of the show game. The show game should not affect your breeding program in any way. Anyway, it does not matter. Um, my goal is to breed a dog that every family can appreciate. They may not breed to it, but they appreciate it and they see the vision I was going for. circuit and that was back when it was 18 bitches to make a three-point major and that is when we had everybody come down I, we had Steve we had Paul of course we had um, Tom and Naola we had Joyce Hauser we had everybody Diane Steele you name it everybody was down and the quality was tough I mean it really was tough do, do, does it degrade now? Like now in Florida, I think it's like um, nine dogs and 11 bitches or something like that, somewhere around in there. Um, we're, we're lucky if we even get two dogs at a show. We are lucky if we can get two dogs. What I have seen is we're not, it's not that we're overbreeding, we're not. I think that a lot of the collie people, because we don't have big kennels anymore, we're being extraordinarily selective in what we're breeding, as we should. We're breeding fewer litters. Yes, we are. But we're also, and I have to say that I think the quality, I, it may only be nine dogs to make a major in Florida, but the quality is so much more than sometimes what we saw 20 years ago. The quality is deeper in what we're seeing. Not every single individual in that ring, but the quality is there. So I think what's happening is because of the times and the way things are, people are being much more selective, which I hope they are, and not just having litters to have litters. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to me, and I know Cindy, we haven't had a litter at our house for, actually we a litter in about what, three years or something like that, of our own breeding. Yeah, we've cloned some out there, but not on our own house. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I'm very, very, very selective in what I do. Um, and I'm breeding for basically me. Um, I'm breeding for something that I want out of that litter. And I have to look, since mom has passed, I have four dogs in the house, they stay in the house. I can't keep 10, 12 dogs like I did. Cindy can't keep 10, 12 dogs. So we're making very selective breedings in what we're doing, getting those, and, and making those breedings for us. And that one, what we're putting hopes for in that breeding, if it comes through, is going to be the next generation that's going to carry on for us in the next 10 years and have that influence for us. So, you know, I, I think it's a little correlation, but yeah, I mean, I understand about four dogs making a major. That's, that's slow. That's slow. Can I change the subject? Okay. I, I, would, I would like to address... Uh, the question of are we finishing dogs too early or do we feel the need to finish dogs too early as a handler i feel like my job is to take what you give me and you tell me what the vision is what what do you want an animal this five-year-old beautiful creature 
that you've taken all this time to prepare um, and look beautiful, have other people notice it, is that the goal? Or is the goal to have this cute little fuzzy thing run through to get, get it done quickly? That, you need to tell me, and I think you need to, to decide yourself. Is it gonna be the big picture? The veteran that holds up when they're 9, 10, and beautiful, still floats around the ring, light is light and skull, as pretty as they can be, or is it instant gratification? Is it, you want that major now? You want that championship now? But you gotta do some soul searching and decide what, what is it you want? And I think once we all decide that, then blah, 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 blah. answer blah, the, blah. the previous question, or you wanna just pass it along? You'll have to remind me what that even was. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking, I was thinking this. So what was the greedy loss of litter is for what? Basically, right? Well, what's the point? I mean, what's the point? I mean, they'll be pretty. What's what? Yeah. It's, what's it's the point? It's, it's effort. It's work. It's you know. What's what's the point? I mean, if you're not gonna if you're not gonna have something that you're gonna be really love and something that makes when you look out in the yard and just makes your heart skip a beat. I mean, what's the point? I mean, you're just you're just cranking out more mediocre. I mean, what's the point? Okay, so what was the question again then? <laughs> um, it was about the just point scale, greedy. about the point scale, the low point well, scale. Well, it was Lori, but it's just breeding a lot of litters. Just breeding a lot. Well, see, I don't breed a lot of litters either. I mean, I'm lucky to breed a litter a year. And I think a lot of us up here, I think we just are small scale. Um, I know the point scale being down to like Mississippi and Louisiana down to four dollars to make a major. It's kind of sad. I wish it wasn't that low. But I guess as breeders, we just have to take pride in our dogs and pride in what we show and, and be more passionate about what we show in the show ring and not just want to show everything because it's we've kept it or, it's, or we want to finish this. Um, there's so many people that's just finishing dogs for numbers. And, and it shouldn't be a number game. I don't know which question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no. Yeah, well, we don't breed just to breed. That's crazy. I'm done. Yeah. You know, I agree with all these guys. Um, earlier, um, I, that's much fun. Um, when we were talking about there's a lack of sires or, you know, uh, dominant sires out there, um, one of the issues that I kind of noticed is that there's um, kind of an over outcross culture in Collies, and I'm wondering if maybe if you agree that um, that may be a reason why there's a lack of. Even when you did outcrosses, it went back to country view. So it was never really, even the outcrosses that you did were within country view. So it was, what I think is he produced so well because he was so line bred, beautifully done. Do you think that the reason why we have a lack of those sires is because of the over outcross culture? Yeah, not necessarily. There's a lot of reasons for it, and I don't think that's necessarily one of them. Or just like that, that is uh, a component of that. Yeah, I'm not even sure there's a component there. I mean, I don't really, I don't really see that. I've seen some beautiful outcross uh, sires that really produce very well, bred into either side of the family or another outcross. So I don't know. I mean, maybe you guys may have some other theories on that, but I don't think so. Anybody want to take that? Matt? I think either they click or they don't, basically. So it's actually ironic you asked that. Um, it was actually a question I had written. The first time I wrote the question, I had worded it line bred families. Because it is a big part of the reason. Um, you cannot consistently get dominant stud dogs unless they are line bred to a certain family dog for those things. 
um, for the sake of the question, it was like, how do we become better breeders as we're looking for dominant stud dogs in our breeding programs? Um, but absolutely, you know, we don't have those number of line bred dogs anymore to a virtuous family. Well, I have a comment about that. Of course, I seem like I have a comment about everything, but I think there's so much of the breeding to the dog of the hour, and some of it is the dog that's on Facebook the most, and that what and people don't stop to think about what they're what they're breeding to. You need to breed to a family. It's got to come from somewhere. I mean, for the most part, the dogs that have sired that aren't line bred or inbred or or bred carefully are flukes. And how are you going to know what they are? But I think that everybody needs to do their breedings with a purpose. And you're going to learn a lot more from your mistakes than you're ever going to learn from your successes. So, you know, sometimes you have to get out there and hopefully, you know, and do a breeding for a purpose. And if it doesn't work out, realize that and move on from there, move on to something else and put those puppies, hopefully healthy puppies, but just not beautiful ones, out of your family of dogs and go on to something else. You need to the history of the breed is so important. You're not going to learn from Facebook. This is unfortunate. It's a problem. It's not the way any of us that are on the panel probably ever started. It's, you know, it's not, it, it's hard to do that because there's so much deception. You look at these pictures on Facebook and you see, I, I see these pictures of puppies that I think, ah, and it gets, 500 likes, and I think, oh my God, what do I know? Probably nothing, but it's like, you need to try and, if you need to have a picture in your mind of what you want to breed for, and sometimes it takes a while to develop that picture. I usually tell people who want to start to go and look at some of the pictures in the old the Library of Champions, and see if the things that they, that they appeal to them fall into a certain family of dogs or a certain look. And that's, we don't all like the same thing, but you know, it's a, it's a family and if you can find it, then you need to find the, the offshoots of that family and try and concentrate on the virtues that are important and look in there. We don't all want to be cookie cutters, but you know, you need to experiment you, but smartly, I don't know how to tell you, it takes a long time to get there and you're going to need to make a lot of mistakes and that's okay. You know, as long as you end up in the end with something that, you know, that appeals to you, that appeals to the judges, whatever. And I have to say, Better early ripe and early rotten than never good at all. That was one of my things that I wanted to say. Judy mentioned Facebook. And I really feel Facebook now has become the new mentor. People consistently pushing their product in your face, almost to the extent of pathetic to try to manipulate you, to brainwash you, to like their dog. It's a, it's a pathetic attempt. There's nothing wrong with having your stud dog mom. Everyone does that. We used to advertise in the queues, in the review, anything. But to get every single week that dog is thrown in your face. New litter, new litter. Well, we're sick of hearing it. Put things on there that are constructive to mentor, since there's no more mentors anymore, they're all Facebook. Put things on there to constructively to educate these people, to show, instead of throwing it in their face over and over and over again. Do you want to see this over and over and over again? Do you want to see it? Every single day, this is my dog, this is my dog, this is my dog. 
Let the dog produce something, then brag about it. Okay? It's my two cents. Yes. Well, it's because, the reason why I said is not to be mean to anybody, because we're not getting the people to mentor anyone. And that's why I'm doing it. We're trying to brainwash and manipulate people to breed to our dogs. It's not right. And it's a very sad attempt to get stud services. Glad to have such a good panel. You can answer a question I'm always looking to know. Why is it always the stud dog's fault? Because everybody needs someone to play. <laughs> That's a good question. I love it. Pass it around, or you think it's enough said? Enough said? Enough said? Okay. 